Here's the truth about the carnivore diet when it comes to building muscle and burning body fat. Some of you may actually find this shocking. Most will not. It's a terrible diet for building muscle and burning body fat. It's not great at all. Now, just because you can only eat meat and survive is not a reason why you should do so. Now, in some cases, this may actually be a diet that's helpful, but in most cases, it is not. So unless you're directed by a functional medicine practitioner or you have a serious situation in which this is the only route to go, avoid going carnivore. I remember when we uh, we were in the first studio, right? Yeah, we were in the first studio and uh, the ketogenic diet was taking off. People were naming their podcast the keto diet and all these things like that because it was the popping trend to the do, keto right? kid. We went to we went to the what was, what was the paleo esque uh, expo or whatever. It was paleo FX. Paleo FX. We went to that. And everything like, was keto. everything was keto and and blue blockers. Right, that was the yeah. thing back then. And you know, I remember you know the knee jerk reaction is me to kind of like uh, you know shit on the whole thing. Yeah, you know what I I should go through it. I should do this diet for a while and experience what it's like being on it. And uh, uh, I remember we all decided to eventually do it. And I happened to be at that time, I had just came out of competing. And so I was, you know, my metabolism, it's kind of like where you're at right now. Metabolism's roaring. I could just mm. eat anything. I'm eating probably 4,000 calories plus a day. And I could not for the life of me <laughs> eat enough meat to hit my caloric yeah. intake. It was just so difficult. And all I could think about was just like, man, I I, I get the uh, gut issues and the elimination diet uh, reasoning behind this, but for a, a strategy to build muscle, this is uh, has to be challenging for a lot of people and not a good idea. No, it's not. It, first, let's talk about who this may be okay for. I or think good in, for, yeah. yeah, I think in 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 some cases the, the people that you find Jordan Peterson is a good example of this so is his daughter, right? You may find a situation not common by this is not common. Um but you may find a situation where a person's so reactive to so many different foods that going down to the one of the most nutrient dense and also simultaneously least likely to cause an immune reaction Bio foods, available foods yeah. which is meat. So meat is, you know, meat in particular, if you were to look at a list of foods that could cause immune type reactions, meat is at the bottom. It's also simultaneously very nutrient dense, which means you can get away. You can get away with just eating meat. If you had to pick one food to do like a yeah, one year challenge, move. that would be it. Nothing else would qualify. Everything else would cause nutrient deficiencies and death. Meat Unlikely to get a nutrient deficiency uh, and and you could survive. That doesn't make it ideal. So in that situation, I could see, uh, like we, we know we know Michaela Peterson. We've interviewed Jordan Peterson. Mm -hmm. Until they can figure out, which until now they're not able to, figure out why their bodies are so reactive to everything, mm -hmm. then this seems to be a good option. In that case, this is the healthier option. This is what's optimizing their health. Now for the average person, this is a terrible idea. Um, the, you're, you're not going to perform and there's, I don't even, I can't even believe I have to say this, but all the data shows this, mm. you're not going to maximize your performance. You're not no. going to be able to eat enough calories, uh, to build muscle. It's just so satiating to eat just meat, uh, every single day. Um, you don't have enough fiber in your diet. And I know the carnivore people try to debate whether it's not true. Look, data shows fiber has got some real, um, health benefits. It's also not realistic from a lifestyle perspective, unless again, you're that individual like Michaela Peterson, where you are in such hell that this is realistic because you never want to go back. Um, but it's taken the world by storm. And I'll tell you exactly why it's taken, not the world, but the fitness space by storm for a while. I'll tell you exactly why. This is a very Paul predictable, it's a very predictable pattern with trendy diets. Yes, yeah, the opposite of That's the it. vegan diet. Yeah. I mean, what, it really is the opposition of that. So yep. you'll see people jump from... Uh, vegan or vegetarian and then like go all the way the other direction to carnivore it, it really is though like something like it, it highlights to me too why people like will be on it and they'll feel this great energy this great effect from it and a lot of times it's all these underlying autoimmune issues that they're not 
uh, dealing with their gut issues, uh, which I think is is a lot more than people realize in terms of the population. Like I think the high majority of people do have something uh, that they're not addressing. But so it's actually kind of go through and use it as an elimination diet or like kind of work your way back and solve yeah. it. I think that there's there's a valid case for that. But yeah. Even just, you know, anecdotally, uh, myself going through it and uh, finding out, yes, I did have, I do have some things I'm I'm definitely dealing with gut-wise, uh, but my performance was flat. My energy was just flat. And it was really exhausting uh, given, you know, month one, then month two of of just like just constant meat um, uh, to eat, which was just, it was hard to do. It's the Republican diet. <laughs> and the, and the, the Democrat diet is the vegan diet. Yeah. That's yeah. what it is. That what it is. A, oh, I mean, diets have become so political. It's so weird. I, I, I literally think that's that, so true and so weird. Yeah, and, for sure. And to your point that we had, you know, the, hey, the, the liberals, the v- vegans had a run for a while there. And then the Republicans had to come up with their diet to argue and fight that side. And yeah. it's, it's, so true. it's, what, we're, it's yeah. what we're seeing. It literally is like that. And it's literally the, 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 the irony too. It's like the same type of hate and anger towards each other. And this person's so right. It's like, Oh my God, it's the reality is most people are somewhere in the middle of this. Really? They really are. Yeah. But everybody wants to divide. It's like you, you're either this, or you're either left or right. It's like, well, no, I'm probably somewhere in the middle because I agree with some of the things these people think and say, and I agree with some of the things that these people think and say. And the truth is the same applies yeah. in the diet well, world. Like you guys, my most social people, policies are like, you know, cruciferous vegetables, and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like the rest of it is more yeah. like, you know, steak. You know, it's, I, I remember in the nineties, um, <clears throat> you know, being in fitness in the nineties, up until the point that I'm about to describe, um, the prevailing, I guess, wisdom or prevailing um, understanding of diet, especially when it came to losing body fat, was low fat. That's what everybody promoted. It was low fat. The government promoted it. Fat was bad for you. Now we know, you know, decades later, that, that, that's not true. Uh, but back then, that was the message. If you want to lose weight, you got to cut your fat. Too much fat uh, will make you fat if you want to improve your health. Cut, cut out your fat. So the market responded by creating low fat products. Every diet was a variety or version of a low fat type diet. And then, you know, Dr. Atkins comes out with his book called the Atkins diet. And the reason why it exploded, the reason why it completely exploded was because it was the opposite, it was the opposite message. So that already makes people go, huh? This guy says I can eat as much fat as I want. I thought fat was evil and bad. What the hell's going on? And then it caused weight loss because it was a low calorie diet. All the diets that make you lose weight are low calorie. So then people were like, it sounds crazy, but I did it. And I did eat as much fat as I want. I just had to avoid all carbs and I lost weight. And so it literally exploded as the supposing. So if you're looking to do a trendy diet, if you want to sell a diet in the diet space and make it trendy, one of the key ways to do it is to low go calorie. is to go against everybody else yeah. or to sound like you're going against everyone else but of course it has to be low calorie and then people will buy it and they'll buy it and you're right carnivore came out because vegan became political well, and became a thing it became righteous and moral and this that and the other save the environment and so you had the other side go well, I'll just kill That's more animals. That's interesting you say that. Yeah, because uh, you know how there's just been this active push against sugar. Like, I mean, sugar is like, you know, uh, enemy number one now in terms of all like health wellness people out there. And it's like, I could see like a yeah. somebody. High again, sugar remember diet. The, yeah, the remember sugar the high sugar coming? diet yeah. or like, a, like the cookie diet was there for a minute. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's, yeah, it, it's totally just like that. It's in it, trends. It's so like that, even to the point to like the advice I give and, and what you see with people, people, uh, like we see in politics, uh, the identity politics game, like, uh, forget attacking one of these presidential camp, uh, candidates for their policies or the things that they do in government. Let's attack yeah. their character. It's just like yeah. the same thing I feel is in, is with these diets. Like people like yeah. praise these, these characters that represent these diets versus like, well, let's dive into like exactly why that diet makes you feel good or doesn't feel good. And maybe figure those things out. It's like the same thing. It's like literally, the same thing. And if we were to play this game a little bit longer. Okay? Yeah, let's do this. Okay, if let's we were to play this a little bit longer and do, like, where's the liber- what is, what's the libertarian diet? 
Mm. Is that fasting? Mm. Are faster are fasters the uh, the libertarians of diet? Yeah, coffee, it's a little anarchy. Like yeah, 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 coffee, yeah. fasting, uh, and then bacon and nine millimeter shells. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. lots <laughs> of bacon and coffee. Guns. Yeah, I like the bacon and Freedom coffee. Guns yeah, yeah, and guns. Who knows? I mean, it's um, I, I don't know. It's it's the, the diet space has always been crazy. I, I could have predicted this, although I don't think I never thought people would go. Oh, I didn't think it was going to get this crazy political. Yeah. I did not think as a trainer. In my early career, I would have forecasted, uh, yeah, diets are going to become up there with religion mm -hmm. and politics to not discuss at the dinner table. Yeah, and, and it has. It and literally medical has medical procedure. Well, yeah. you know what it is? is When you do a diet and it changes your life, it, it becomes your religion. It becomes yes. your belief system. And anybody telling you otherwise is denying your personal experience, right? So I'll give you an example. My, I, my great... I've, brought him up before because I think it's a great example. My great grandfather, he died at 91. So remember that's, a, that, that's not my grandfather, my great grandfather. So that's a different generation. He smoked cigarettes from nine years old, I believe up until the day he died. And he, and he, the way he smoked, this is, I remember this as a little kid, he would light the cigarette in his mouth. He would light another cigarette with that. So he would never stop. It was constant. And the only time he didn't smoke was when he was eating dinner, and after right after he was done, he'd light back up. He would smoke in bed while he was trying to sleep. He almost set himself on fire a couple of times. No way. So he smoked so much. So if I tell, uh, if I told him cigarettes are bad for you, they cause it's like I'm, I'm denying his personal experience. What are you talking about? I'm 88, five years old. I still go out in the backyard yeah. and you know work and work on my trees and stuff. You're crazy. So when you're telling somebody who did a carnivore diet and for whatever reason. For whatever reason, it's making them feel better than they were. They're going to fight you uh, tooth and nail yeah. uh, over it because. But the truth is, it's it's not a great diet. Um, we do we definitely do need balance, and just because you can get away doing with doing something doesn't mean it's. But what's funny to me too, eat the carnivore is and vegans are the same thing. There's extreme veganism where it's like if it comes from any animal in any way, shape, or form. It's wrong. Right. And then they're kind of like making concessions like, well. So they can't wear leather either. Yeah. Right? Like, this is like, oh, uh, this yeah. is what I find is always yeah, funny. Yeah, they roll the up their, Look at your shoes. Their leather yeah. seats your belt. in their car. Yeah, look at your <laughs> wallet. Well, like, I mean, it, it could go so far as that some vegans won't even eat honey because uh, insects make it, right? So they go so far. But then there's some concessions like, well, I'll do milk. That's okay wow. because, I, you know, I need, the, I need the proteins. I need the milk. Oh, well, you know, I'll do eggs or I'll do, you see this with the carnivores. Yeah. You get the extreme carnivores, like only meat. And then you got the other people who are like, well, well I want to do some honey. Honey's fine. That's fruit. from an animal. Yeah. So we can kind of do it. And then you go, oh, well, I like to throw fruit in because it doesn't have some of the. But not the icky reactive. vegetables. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm on board. Like, yeah. 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 But if you're trying to, I mean, if you go on a carnivore diet, you will lose weight, but that's because your calories go real low. You have Which almost is, no carbohydrates. That's the same formula for every diet. Yes. It's always and you'll been. lose water and all that stuff. But that's why the cabbage diet, the pizza diet, they all existed at one point too. It's just like you could eat one slice of pizza a day and you'll lose weight. You know? I'd say the craziest diet that I I ever followed was just my I want to get big at any cost teenage boy diet. That was when I was oh, yeah. yeah. That didn't even have a name. It was dirty, just like eat dirty every, bulk. Eat anything yeah. and everything inside. I remember when I, I when I, I was young when I figured this out, right? Because I was reading all the bodybuilding magazines. When I realized that, oh, it's about protein, then what I would do is I would look at foods and I would look at, oh, if I ate this literally this is my, my rationale. If I eat a pound of pasta that's 30 grams of protein. Okay. So I'll do that. Yeah. Or, oh, peanuts have protein? I'm going to eat a whole jar of peanuts. Or it was. I just heard, and this is this was from one of my friends, even still espousing like uh, the, the Costco cheese pizza of having like something like 40 or 60 grams of protein. Or something. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like what? The, <laughs> no effing way. The family size of Chef Boyardee raviolis oh, was yeah. like 56 grams of protein. Yeah. So that was and like also a bunch of other many times my that was your meal. That was a, that was a dinner right Bro, there. Throw I, it in the can and or throw it in the pan and just heat it up. I'm and, embarrassed to say that I took because when I, I remember tuna fish when I discovered tuna fish, like holy shit, it's like 36 <laughs> grams of protein. I made. Uh, and, and, you know, when you're a teenage boy trying to gain weight and it's yeah. hard to eat because you, know, you got fast metabolism. I'm so glad I wasn't around because your breath. I blended <laughs> it in a blender. That's disgusting. So oh. I could pound it faster. And that's, that's disgusting. And I just 
To this day, you guys know that. I've seen, so, I've seen the, uh, you know, the strongman guys do that because how big they are and they have to eat. It's like, hard to get the yeah five six. I wasn't calories. no strongman. I was 140 pounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I never. I, I opened the of mouth. All and the down crazy the things I did. What's the craziest thing you ever did? I would say so. I made some crazy shakes where I would add like five six raw eggs inside yeah, there on, on top That's of every. I know. Well, I mean, and then I would uh, like, like so for a while there. I'd have dinner. A protein shake and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich was like you a, that a like a like a meal. I don't know. It felt, <laughs> it felt pretty hardcore. It felt pretty hardcore. <laughs> I, I definitely wasn't like blending it all up in a blender. You and know why? Because you got into it when you were older than me. I was a teenager. I was fifteen. Yeah, when you're yeah. really dumb. Yeah, yeah. You know I lasted I mean? a month of doing the raw eggs like Rocky. Like I did like three or four, and I would go. Work now, did out. you literally crack them in a glass, or did you blend crack them in a glass? Oh, so you swallowed then, the uh, through the, yeah, the yolk, the yeah, lump, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god, just trained. Yeah, yeah I to, did that too. The crazy, the, the absolute craziest thing I ever did though was, um, and I did this for a while, and it was my gains were dropping for obvious reasons, but I was hard headed. I I set an alarm. Uh, in the middle I did of that night too. So I wake mean, up. Yeah, I used to have a little mini fridge next to my bed and I used to have the EAS ready to drinks and an alarm would go off at like two o'clock in the morning and I would like, you know, wouldn't even like roll over, just grab it, sit up for a second and pound it and then go right back to sleep. Like a baby. <laughs> uh -huh. You did a dream feed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's terrible. Meanwhile, doing shitty workouts. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's so funny how our priorities were so. Oh, and like, losing sleep like an idiot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like exactly. That's the most anabolic yeah. thing training. You do. Training seven days a week, double days, and then doing that in the middle of the night. It's like, yeah, give, me, disrupting my sleep and uh, terrible programming. Uh, but I was hitting that protein yeah. intake. You know, yeah. it was just like. Yeah. You weren't taking enough supplements. That was the problem. I, I mean, it's it's wild when you when I think back to like the. I mean, obviously, this is what a lot of what motivated us to do this right was mm -hmm. like you know the, uh, a, a lot we were in i was in the fitness space doing a lot of stupid fitness doing a lot of stupid still. stuff still right yeah, so yeah. I, i'm supposed to be leading the way and still doing a lot of things the wrong way so i think that was a lot of this motivation was like man there's still probably a lot of people uh probably messing up the priorities of yes. building muscle uh speeding your metabolism up losing body fat it, it's funny how um it's funny how much easier it really is when you focus on the right things and how much more difficult it is when you overcomplicate a lot of the, the wrong things. You know what I'm saying? Oh, it's you make like, it impossible. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right. Back to the show. Speaking of correct, incorrect information, the narrative around uh, diet and all that, I strongly believe that LMNT has single-handedly created a trend in the health space that is changing the narrative around sodium. Oh, they yeah. really, for sure, they did. You've for, never heard for it sure they did. spoken this way. No, yeah. listen, my so you know this is this is one of our sponsors but it's a very interesting um conversation because they sent us a rob wolf who we loved we, we we had him on the show years ago early days loved him hit it off you know right out the gates sent us uh, a box of lmnt and it sat in the back of the studio back there for months and first of all we didn't know rob wolf sent it we just saw this box and you know i look at every supplement i'm the supplement person right so i looked mm -hmm. at it and i'm like electrolytes whatever waste of time and we left it there and it just stayed there for a while. And then um, I think it was Katrina who goes, hey, did you guys want to try that supplement from Walt, Rob Wolf? And I'm like, Rob, I love Rob. What did he send? And she's like, the you know the box in the back. I'm like, electrolytes? Like, Why would Rob, like such a dumb supplement. So then I went back there and I looked at the box and then I, fi I quickly realized what had happened. I said, uh oh, these are a thousand milligrams of sodium per packet. Mm -hmm. He's actually doing electrolytes the right way. I mean, one of the reasons why electrolytes are such a waste of time. Just sugar water. Yeah. They barely put it's enough sodium to make. I mean, I used to give my clients sea salt or to help them, not electrolyte powder. So they were so low, they'd have to take like seven packets yeah, and then end up with a bunch of sugar. In. And so when I remember when I saw it, I'm like, oh, he he's doing this the right way. Yeah. Um, and then we decided to try it out uh, and work with them. And now, because sodium had that narrative too, right, where it was bad for you. Too much sodium is bad. Everything's got to be low sodium. Yeah. It's bad, bad, bad. And you look at the data, and this is just not true. Yeah. Uh, when you when you control for processed foods, which is why high sodium looks like it's bad, because 
the people with the highest sodium diets are eating a lot of processed food. When you control for that, and especially if you apply it to athletic populations, people eat a whole food diet, people are healthy, it's better to have more sodium than less. Yeah. It's actually, uh, it improves athletic performance and health. And so the data showed that. And then I think the other part that made them change the narrative was salt is one of the key components to palatability. So now you have a sugar-free drink, not artificially sweetened. So it's got natural sweetener, which doesn't taste as good as the artificial stuff. It's okay. So you're like, well, is it going to taste good? It does because it's got a lot of sodium. Mm -hmm. So you drink like a can. Yeah. And because of the smooth. sodium, yeah. no, so it good. gives you, it's, it makes it palatable. And so right away, I'm like, this is going to crush. And sure enough, that company's gone. But they're changing the narrative. You're, I'm now well, seeing other so companies. Much. There's a bunch of companies now. A lot of companies. Yeah, yeah. They were, they were first to market. To, to market like and actually sell, um, you know, hydration drinks with yes. the right amount of sodium in it. But now you see, I even think uh, Gatorade now has actually came out to try and compete with a, like a higher sodium drink. You know, I'm going to mm. just say this out loud to, to supplement people who are want to make supplements. Like, don't be a pussy. Like, <laughs> Rob Wolf is not, uh, a, 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 he's not afraid because he put out a, a product with a thousand milligrams of sodium, which with all the all the popular narrative yeah. out there was back in the day, that seems absurd. Sodium's bad for you, but he knew the data. Yeah, he knew the data. So there's other stuff that's out there uh, in 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 the nutrition world that's false. Find the lies. Don't be afraid to counter with the truth. And I think in the in the age of social media, I think you might be able to get it out, and then you'll crush. I think cholesterol, a little bit of a parallel there yes. in terms of misinformation around it and how essential actually dietary it is dietary oh, yeah. cholesterol is. But yeah, it's it's because too, and it's this, this fear and this you know push for uh, you know blood pressure medication, and there's this yeah. whole industry you know kind of behind a lot of the messaging of that. So. You know, we had to really kind of like unpack that and and get to the root of like, well, this is actually very beneficial and it's a performance enhancement for you in the gym. Uh, and a lot of people are actually deficient. So it's like, it's, it's crazy that, uh, you know, we were fed completely the opposite I know. message. It's hilarious. Anyway, I just read a study on um, a diet study. I got to read it to you guys. So things are catching up is what I want to say before I read this. So this was just published. So people ask me often where I get my studies. Uh, ScienceDaily.com is a great place to read new studies that are um, posted. And what you can do, they even have a menu where you can look at things like health studies, tech studies, environmental studies, society studies, quirky. Um, and so I always like to look at the fitness and health. And, and here's the title of this particular study. This came out of the University, University of Illinois. Um, and it says, weight loss success. You ready for this? Yeah. You're going to love this, Adam. Weight loss success depends on eating more protein and fiber while limiting your calories. <laughs> that's a new. What that's a study know? now showing exactly. Here's your sign. Been, what we've been what we've been saying. <laughs> pounding this in everybody's brains. Yes. So in other words, people cut their calories, they lost weight, but people who ate a lot of protein and made sure their fiber was high did far better. Far better in terms of keeping the weight off, losing body fat, basically across. The best the part body. about like these Duh. studies that are coming out that are basically proving what we've been saying for a long time is that they're 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 still not even addressing the behavioral component which yeah. is what we sp i think speak so heavily to and it's crazy to me because now now you're getting the stuff to, to, to support the the scientific reason of why going this direction is the better out but i, I mean i think that even that study leaves out the the power of like telling clients to go after things in their diet and yeah. the benefits of that i mean to me that was one of the most profound uh strategies that i changed in my uh training career with clients was ha having that aha moment of first of all majority of people you train middle age want to lose weight uh, most of them have yo-yo dieted and most of them fail when you put them on a diet and so okay how can i do something different and it was like you know what if and I know this all about protein, I know this about fiber. When I look at these diets, everybody's under eating protein. I know how essential that is to building muscle. What if, what if I tell these overweight people that I'm not going to tell them they can't have anything anymore. I'm going to instead find these things that I know are so beneficial to them that if I just tell them to go get those things without telling them they can't have things, what happens? Yeah. I'm sure as shit. It works. It works so and well. It's unbelievably well. And it's simpler for them to follow. They're not weighing and measuring and tracking a bunch of stuff. It's like literally the only thing they're paying attention to is go get my protein, have my yep. fiber, 
and that's all you, I'm going to focus on. You know what's so magical about that is uh, protein encourages muscle or preserves muscle. So a high protein calorie controlled diet in comparison to another diet with lower protein, you, you lose more fat and keep more muscle. But the magic is protein and fiber are both satiety producing. So by telling people to eat those and aim for those and eat that first, you're also yeah. kind of in a sneaky way. It's actually a very sneaky way by of getting them to eat less yeah. without even telling them to eat less. And so what they think they're doing is eating more or chasing something rather than taking things away. And then it ends up in, in, in reduced calories. It, you know, it reminds me of like, uh, I remember I used to get teased for the, in fact, I remember when we first started this and I, and we did YouTube and I did a video. I remember the comments, gotta love YouTube comments of me teaching. Uh, I think the video was something like the only way to do, I, like the title was something like the only way or the best way to do a bicep curl or whatever. And it was me. Oh yeah. It was Your me, staggered stance. Yeah. It was teaching me a bicep curl in a staggered stance and all oh, the comments went bananas, right? Everybody just freaking out. But the but where that came from was years of experience training clients and getting frustrated with like man I can't get these people to stand up tall with their chest out and their shoulders back as soon as they I tell them to focus on their elbows then all of a sudden they slouch over and it's like it's just like crazy yeah, their back you know for somebody who had a athletic background and uh, was able to like mimic or mirror good form and technique relatively easy to realize that oh shit most people aren't like me aren't like this and in fact most of them have a really hard time doing something as simple as a bicep curl so I had came. I noticed though when I did core training, when I was balance, when I was doing all this balance, we went through that balancing phase, right? Where everything was on one leg and your split stance, Dynadisc disc, everything. Dyna -disc everything. The thing that I noticed was when when clients would st stand up or where they could balance, they had to be in good posture. They had to activate their core because in order to stabilize it, their core would would activate. They would align themselves in good posture, and they would in order to stay balanced, they would stay there. It was like, oh wow. If instead of me telling my clients, shoulders back, chest up high, elbows by your side, keep your wrists straight, like instead of saying all that, found I'm, a little I found a hack. It was like, I'm going to put them in a split stance, throw their balance off so that it's going to force and them. And they're, they're going to have good form. And then they had great form. And it was like, <laughs> oh my God, this was like, that's all I had to do. And so that became this like massive hack. So, I mean, that to me, this is the, uh, you know, that's the movement hack to like the nutritional thing, like, and getting to become a, a better trainer and coach was figuring all those little things out. It's like totally. my desired outcome is that my, my client learns, they improve, they get the results. So, you know, and this, the traditional way we've been taught in a lot of these books that we all read to learn how to be trainers, they miss this part. They miss the behavioral stuff in nutrition and they miss these That's small they're hacks by, for mechanics. They're written by exercise scientists and nutritionists. That's why they're not written by coaches uh, who've, who've worked with people. That's, that's, a, that's, that's, cl like, if I heard you say that, I would 100% guess right away, oh, mm -hmm. you've trained a lot of people. Because yeah. cause that doesn't make sense unless you've trained a lot of people and you know that biomechanically doesn't make sense. It doesn't give you more leverage. It doesn't whatever, but it gets people to behave in a way that uh, is beneficial. And when you're a coach, getting people to behave in the ways that are beneficial is everything. Yeah. Everything else is That's secondary. That's how you win. That's yeah. it. Yeah. I, isn't it like, I mean, isn't that like being a dad too? Isn't that like parenting? Totally. Is that like our job as a dad too? You have like, to be effective. Yes. Of course. It's like my desired outcome is to get my kid to do things. Like sometimes I have to do creative things yeah. to get them to do it. It's not as straightforward. It's like I son call just it placing cones. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just place is cones where is it like strategically and, and you know that they're going to turn around the cone. That's uh, awesome. That's yeah. I love that. Yeah. Dude, speaking of diets and fitness and all, study just, as of the recording of this podcast, a study just came out by Eli, Eli, Eli Lilly. Am I saying that right? That's the the pharmaceutical company. Okay. Um, so this is a big one, okay? We've been talking about GLP-1s. Uh, we've been talking about how their potential impact on society is going to be massive, culture shifting. Well, they just, uh, Eli Lilly, is, their drug is, I believe, Wagovi. No, sorry, their drug is Monjaro. And Monjaro is terzepatide. So this is the next generation of GLP-1. And they just released their long- Study. So this study was done for a long period of time. Here's what they found. This is, by the way, blockbuster, crazy, insane stuff. In, in, is this in, the Generation 4 one? No, uh, no this okay. is terzepatide. This is terzepatide. Now, yeah, if you, now, if you went through our partner's MP hormones, they have terzepatide. Okay, yeah. Now, would we, would we but guess, this is another generation past Okay, so or, would we guess this? Is this, or are we, are we on to this, what you're about to say? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. This is what we've been saying. Okay. okay. But this is now so an not, official study trial. 
okay, published. Come, they're about to release it. Their stock's gonna explode, okay? Right. The, the, this particular peptide, trizepatide, reduced the risk of developing type 2 diabetes, you ready for this? By 94% Whoa. in obese or overweight individuals with prediabetes compared wow. to a placebo. That's huge. 94%. Wow. Th yes. The uh, it also showed that they experienced sustained weight loss. So you ready? So check this out. There's big industry around uh, around that. Uh, big? Are you like, kidding me? Yeah, like think of all the drugs and, connected yeah. to obesity: blood pressure, uh, blood lipid, uh, diabetes medications, uh, anti-inflammatory pain Cholesterol. medications. Uh, oh my yeah, god! Yeah, I mean, like uh, it, it's just going to be interesting for me to see how they're gonna you know deal with this and, and sort of pivot well they're or, gonna they're gonna have a smear campaign for sure exactly so i've been waiting for that i guess so now so. check out this study right this is a long study it's a big one more than a thousand adults over wow. 176 weeks which is how long is 176 weeks is that oh three God, years like uh, that? four almost four years uh, yeah. three years three, three and a half years three and a half years a thousand people a thousand people over a three-year period followed by a 17-week period where patients stopped treatment it's a great study. Yeah. It's a yeah. very good study. People taking the higher doses of it lost, on average, 22% of their body weight. Wow. Wow. So if you're, so if you're, so three, a quarter of who if you're you are. 30, 300 pounds, that's, what is that, 60 something pounds yeah. that mm -hmm. you're going to lose? Yeah. Which is big time. That's a, that's a big weight loss. It's not going to give you everything you want, but that's a lot. Nothing's ever come close to that. What's a trip is in the study when they took people off. A significant percentage of them didn't gain the weight back. They stayed off wow. after 17 weeks. Now I have a theory around this, <clears throat> and my theory is this: because they were on it for three years, the longer you don't, and I've, I've said this on previous podcasts, the the longer you don't um, repeat a behavior or a habit, the weaker that habit has sure, becomes, the, the less power that has over it. So for three years, they have this appetite uh, suppressing effect. They're not engaging the same behaviors for three years. That's a long time. When they go off, they're less likely to go, I'm going to go back to the way that I used to be. Because it's a it's a memory at that point. It's only three years. 100%. This is why I think with coaching, you know, you go on a GLP-1, you work with a good coach, or you do this yourself. You train properly, eat enough protein, don't lose muscle, all that stuff we talked about. But if you can, I don't think it'll take you three years. I think if you do months and then replace your old behaviors with new behaviors, I think mm. you'll get similar, if not better results. And now, you'll be able to come off. How deep did you go into mm. this study yet? Did you? That's just what I read in the okay, article. Okay, so you don't know yet. Like, I'm curious to like, who strength trained, who didn't strength train, did they control for anything like that? I don't like, think they did any strength training whatsoever. Oh, wow, I'm almost just, positive. See, this is the problem. With I would these, love to see that study. Yeah, because here's the problem with some of these studies. I mean, I, I, mean, I know why you're highlighting, because that's amazing, period. If someone just took that stuff and that, I was all the positive thing. But I mean, I think that someone with... Uh, you know, coaching and with training and like helping these people along too, the success rate and the results are going to be incredible. A lot of the stuff that is getting uh, perpetuated in the in media that's negative as far as like the amount of muscle that's being lost. It's like they're just giving this to people and saying just yeah. and then tracking them. If you just eat less, that's like what happens. Which by it's the like way, high like, dose. Which by the way, take the drug out of this. Take uh, the uh, GLP one out of the equation and just tell people to eat half the calories and do yeah. the exact. And then same thing. Same will thing will happen. Yeah, you'll see the same amount of muscle loss, if not potentially no more. more. Because yep, yep. So it's like it, that. That's not like a aha got you. It's like a yeah. That's what happens when someone goes from eating. This is. 2,500 to 1,200 calories, and they don't strength train. They don't prioritize pro protein. I mean, uh, of course. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. again, just for uh, people who don't know, this is why we created um, our MAPS GLP-1 program, is to have uh, programming that's appropriate. Because here's the deal. A lot of people are going to be taking these. And as, this, as these studies keep coming out, this is going to keep uh, the popularity, yeah. the use, the, the, the prescriptions from doctors. It's going to continue to grow and grow and grow um, for until, and now here's the other side of it. This is what I think with the muscle loss. Cause that's a problem by the way. I want to say this uh, very clearly. Being over fat causes poor health. So does being under muscled. Right. Okay. So, so you might solve just, one problem. You may cause another one. Yeah. You're robbing Peter to pay Paul. You might end up doing that. In some cases it might be, you know, worse overall and you lose mobility and, yeah. and all that stuff. I foresee, this is exactly what pharmaceutical companies are doing right now. They're looking at GLP ones. Like this is our big money maker. We're going to spend a, most of our money in research and development trying to figure out better GLP-1s and better GLP-1s. But also, we need to figure out how we can create an accessory 
to this drug, which pharmaceutical drugs do, uh, companies do. We need to come up with new muscle building. Muscle, yeah, yes. sparing. I, I predict a huge formulas. influx of new muscle preserving, muscle mm. building drugs. Totally. That I'm going to be very afraid of when those come out. <laughs> yeah, because what yeah. are those going to do? <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's Probably myostatic hitting something. Exactly. It'll I mean, be some, oh, my God. Yeah. Some anyway. serious. Speaking of working out and stuff, Justin, you are the most consistent with the zero shoes. I am, yeah. Uh, I saw you wear them yesterday. What's your ver- you wear them all- very regularly? I actually wear them more often now. I I w- I went through like a quite a, a kick uh, back in the day wearing minimus shoes, and uh, what I like about the zero shoes is is the wide toe box because my my toes. I know you guys that make fun they're of gorgeous. me. I make fun of myself. They're, uh, they're very Would smashed. You Would you give them a kiss around the toe? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Has any girl sucked on those feet? Never. What? Never. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You paused. Never. That yeah. should have been a fast has, no. Yeah. Has any guy no. sucked on those feet? No. <laughs> no, absolutely That was not. a faster <laughs> no. Yeah, 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 but the no, first yeah. one, I'm not no, questioning. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was a, it was a weird time. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was college. I, <laughs> yeah, you were um, Yeah, no. So, it, it, and I'm pretty sure it was because I had this, I don't know, like I think every athlete has – somewhat of a um what do you call that when you're like superstitious a little bit and you have kind of rituals oh yeah and so i used to really tighten up i used to get like cleats specifically that felt super tight yeah yeah. and i ever since i was a kid and then going all the way up yeah all the way up through college it does feel safer now i think about it if i I just feel faster i feel like i'm like like i don't have any room to with your little no that's exactly when we were kids (laughs) we were taught i was taught that (laughs) when we we played (laughs) basketball this is funny the point you're bringing up the point you're bringing up right now is really by the way do you know that Zero shoes is, is signed with some NBA players. Oh wow! No so way! Oh yeah, you pull oh, it up, Doug. Awesome. Go zero shoes. Oh, that's done deal. Yeah, yeah zero if shoes. They start wearing them. Yeah, M- NBA players. Yeah, they have a couple of athletes. They've Obviously signed already. Obviously, wear them in the off season, right? Well, no, like, playing, bro. Playing with zero yeah, shoes. This is why. Okay, okay, this is why this is a really interesting conversation to me because so we've gotten it, a foot anatomy and function all wrong. We did yes, all yes. wrong. We when we were kids, we were taught high tops. The high high tops. Yeah, you lace them up. Tighten the hell out. You tighten the yeah. shit out of them so you lock your ankle into place. Yeah, and we thought that was the smarter, safer way it's to play prevent ball. you there from is. getting Justin injured. Holiday right there. Wow. Yeah, okay. I don't know if they have any pictures of him actually playing in the NBA. He absolutely wears them in the game. I watched him uh, wearing them in the game. But that this is how far we've come. Where you have basketball players that have gone the complete opposite direction. Now you're wearing minimalist shoes on a basketball court. And your and the ankle injuries and foot injuries are going down, Reduce. and knee injuries are going down. You know down. what? What's, what happened is we conditioned our, we, we conditioned ourselves to perform in spite of the fact that we locked up our feet and ankle. If you looked at an anatomy picture of a foot, just not even an ankle, look at a foot. Look at the bottom of your foot. There's a lot of muscles there. There's a lot of stuff happening. And what we did is we cramp, and the toes should be spread to create more. Stability and function. Yes. What we did is we Bro, crammed the, everything together. I wish it's the, you guys know it's, it's the, the highest concentration of nerve endings in the I entire know. body. Uh-huh. Over seven thousand nerves in the feet, and we put them to sleep. Yeah, like from birth. From birth, we yeah. strap up cute little shoes on our our babies, and they and we. And walk you know up. what's funny is like, uh, and even a doctor was trying to explain because my dad had to have like his toes broken, and and like he's like, oh, you're gonna look forward to this. Like, like I could have prevented all that. You know, like that was self-inflicted. Like yeah. that's not like like hammer toe isn't like you know, <laughs> just something that uh, uh, you know I was born Sounds with. Sounds like your wrestling name, <laughs> <laughs> hammer toe, dude. That's yeah. it's crazy I'm though when uh, when something uh, permeates our culture so deep that it's so you, it's hard. It's believed. Yes, it's believed uh-huh. as like truth. I mean, to the point where I mean, I got into so many fights with my own family members about my son being barefoot. Like it right. was like a real legit. The two maybe hardest things for me was the sh- no sugar for my kid. I mean, I was the worst father in the world for you know re- not la- allowing my one year old to eat candy yet. And then, oh my God, I'm gonna they're gonna call child services on me for not putting shoes on my son as he walks outside <laughs> in rocks and dirt. Like, oh my God, I'm torn. God forbid, yeah. No. And it's like I, I literally had to get into that fight like so much. Now it was so awesome. Both those things. I mean, it's like, you know, this is a pat myself on the back moment yeah, right here. Stick because, to your guns. Because here I am now at five years old and I actually see what has happened. One. My son loves to be barefoot. So like he mm-hmm. kicks his shoes off wherever he goes. He always want he does not want to wear socks yeah. his shoes all the time. So I don't even have to talk about it ever again. He loves that. He's unbelievably stable. We never went through that 
toddler falling down crashing phase that every kid goes through. He was he had such great balance and stability. When I look at his feet when he walks some of that, he is, his ankles straight. I mean, he's so balanced and stable. He's got a beautiful uh, normal squat. And I don't have to say nothing about it ever again. Yeah. Same thing for the candy and the sugar thing. I allow my kid, my, my kid, to have candy now or to have treats. And because it was regulated so tightly when he was young, he doesn't have that. He never developed a taste. Yes, for it. and I can't stress that enough for parents who have newborns with like the shoe thing. Like the shoe thing is a thing still that we think is a good Dude, idea. It is not a good idea to put shoes my on our doctor, babies. My doctor, my when I was a baby, the doctor encouraged my mom to put. Stiff sold. This is what they said to my mom. Yeah. Put stiff soled shoes on him. He'll walk earlier. So the early baby shoes, you still find them like this. They're some, they're like a very stiff sole. Yes, they're yeah. like and, a high heel. And they would yes. say, yeah. yes. It, they used Ridiculous. to say, oh, it gives them it gives them better balance and stability, so they can walk earlier. Yeah. You know. Meanwhile, now I have ankle mobility and foot <laughs> mobility issues. Ah. Terrible, dude. Yeah. Terrible. I well, that's. I mean, you know, kind of back to what I'm wearing. I I started wearing them more consistently because I kind of stopped. Uh, really heavy squatting, like, and, and and this was just something I've noticed, like, over the years, like, it's, I, I'm starting to kind of feel the effects of, uh, you know, my hips, and like, I'm getting a little bit of arthritis, kind of. But let me let me just add a little caveat before you 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 uh, people get uh, misinformed here. Uh, it's not squats that are making you hurt like that. You're strong, so when Justin says heavy squats, he's like 300, 350. So you can still squat. You're just not going. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going Double your balls weight. to the wall. That's right. Yeah. And, and two, I'm, I guess, I guess I should have said I'm shifting my focus uh, more on the stability yeah. side of it right now to address instability in, in what my body's telling me. Right. right. Uh, as opposed to like, oh, I'm getting rid of squats. No, I'm coming back. But I have to reinforce now. Uh, where I feel this this imbalance, and, and uh, for me, it's just like a lot of split stance. It's a lot mm -hmm. of like lateral training. It's a lot of sled drags. It's a lot of that kind of stuff. And to be able to have that kind of uh, ability just to splay out my toes and to really get that uh, solid ground force uh, and anchoring that I need, you know, with my feet, like the these shoes are way better at that. Well, yeah. it's still a little a little embarrassing to admit that. You know, this is this is relatively new for me. Like, I remember we had already started the podcast, and I up until that point, I had not really looked at feet Ever. as as a root cause to movement dysfunction yes. in my clients. I'm embarrassed to admit that because it's like there's we talk on the show a lot, right? Of all these like paradigm shattering moments and shifts yeah. in our career and what we did wrong before and we did right. I mean, I made it all the way to the podcast, which by that time I would have said I'm a, I was a pretty damn good trainer by the time we were on this podcast. And I remember when and Dr. Brink, Justin Brink, our, our, our buddy, who's a movement specialist, also helped us write Maps Prime Pro, when he broke me down and he was like, oh, yeah, it's your foot and ankle. And I'm like, huh? I mean, I was just like oblivious to it. And he did some tests with me and then and exp explained what was going on and, and why my hips and low back and all this stuff was... And oh my God, like when I addressed that and fixed that, like everything went away. And now when I look at the way somebody is moving or if they have any issues, it's like the feet are the first place I go because more often than not, that's where the root cause is. You know, you may have your 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 knees may be yeah. caving in. You might have a slight external rotation on the left side, more to the right side, or an asymmetrical shift. But many times it goes, it's starting it's from the foot. Compensating from the foot. Yes, the foot uh, and, and due to weak and uh, weak feet and just poor function. Yes, I know. And I know. At least you look. You might even have an excuse because you weren't introduced to ankle and foot mobility. I, I mean, I'm, I, 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 it's worse for me. I had a studio with a ex, with an exceptional physical therapist who also um, was ahead of the game when it came to lots of different things. She used to have her clients come into the studio. And one of their assessments was they'd take their shoes off, they'd take their socks off, she'd watch them stand, she'd wa and then she'd watch them walk back and forth. Yeah. Now, here's why it's embarrassing. This is what happens when your ego gets in the, in the way. I would look through the side of my eye and be like, oh, my God, she's doing another stupid walking assessment. Like, what are you going to learn from? Just have them work out. Like, what's the I could have learned a lot. I could have <laughs> learned all this so yeah, long I ago. 
So embarrassing. Mom, yeah. Mom. That's yeah. Nice. I, so, I mean, for our audience, <laughs> from our, our audience, of course, if you're an adult, you know, things like zero shoes like that, awesome, awesome for you to have. But I can't stress enough to the parents that, yeah. you know, you have an opportunity to really set that trend for your child uh, and set them up for success by simply avoiding wearing shoes for as long as you well, can. And trust me, let me tell you something. You think that walking on things like dirt and gravel hurt your feet? That's because we have pussy ass feet that you've had weak <laughs> for so long. God, can you Google and, that real quick? And yeah. if you if you actually feet train, like feet. you would be surprised how tough your feet become by th they will adapt. By the way, it's not just. I'm gonna back this up. It's not just because people are thinking, oh, I'm gonna have like leathery, calloused feet. No, 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 no. Your feet are so insanely sensitive because all they ever feel is socks and shoe. Yes. That it's a CNS overwhelmed signal. It's like it's like if you're in a silent it's room. Yeah. It's, like, it's like you're you in a silent you, room and then you hear any noise. You if you were born it. and you wore snow gloves your whole life, a pencil, writing with a pencil would hurt your hands. Yeah, it'd be overwhelming. The yes. sensation would be overwhelming. Yes, that's what, what you feel. So you no, know it's not hard for your kid to do that. Like if you introduce it early yeah. on and let them adapt to it, yeah, man. I mean that, and that was a boy that tripped my family out because by the time he'd already been introduced to that for multiple yeah. Did years. Did you guys ever? By the time he's three, he's I'm having him walk on like sharp rock and everything. They're I don't remember like, her name, but there's this, there's, yeah. there's, yeah. there's this trainer that like I don't know if you ever listened. Uh, 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 Joe Rogan had her on the podcast, but she was like super hardcore about that uh, mentality because the, the other part of it was like we don't see far enough, uh, and so it was like, well. Okay, just back to to the actual her setup for her house. She had like furniture that had no cushion. She had like oh. so her bed had like she just sleep on a, a a wood bed like frame basically, and then would you'd like sit comfortably on the ground, and so She's the whole thing was like she was encouraging like you had to like basically uh, form your body into a position that was comfortable uh, in order mm. to. And, and said that like between her and her kids and everybody else has, has found ways to, um, you know, like adapt and make it work with their body. But it's just like, it was so hardcore. It was like listen, to the extreme. You know? I there's mean, some I truth listen, in this, by there, the way. There is. There is. There is. It's there just is. like, there's, there's fall, levels. And this know? is like, I, I do think I fall somewhere in the middle of this, right? Like for, I'm always, and we talk about this too with like xenoestrogens and stuff like that. There's ver there's very small, subtle things and, and choices that you can make in your life to greatly improve the exposure of xenoestrogens. There's small things you can do in your life to improve the strength of your feet. It's like, how hard is it really just to say, in fact, it's actually easier. Hey, I don't have to put no socks and shoes on my kid. It's yeah. like one less thing I got to do. <laughs> so it's like, instead of like, like we've just ritualized so okay. much of getting ready for the day, get them all dressed, got to put his socks, got to put his shoes on. You know, I did just said, no, we don't like, we don't have to do any of that shit. Mm -hmm. Like my son literally just was barefoot all the time and I never put socks and shoes on him until way later. And so it's, it's a, it was an easy thing to implement in my life that I knew that could greatly improve his life. And so, well, you know why it's so important for kids? Because at after a certain point, you know, if you're 20 years old or 30 or 40 or older and you're like, oh, I have all this dysfunction in my feet. Let me correct it. You'll get, you'll get a lot of, uh, benefits, but you're not going to fix 100 percent because some of it has been done permanently. No, I've ne as so much when you do work it, I've when done to my feet. I've never been able to get them to look like you they're can't. They to. never will. Like, I, like it, there's it's like a certain there's a certain amount of I don't know for lack of a better term developmental or development. yeah period. That's right. But children, if you start early, they don't they're not going to have that problem. Yes, they're yeah. not going to have that problem because they allowed their body to develop in a way to where. They're okay. But yeah, you, I mean, you could fix lots of mobility issues on someone, but the longer they've had those mobility issues, the harder it is to go, to go back to what's uh, ideal. In some cases, like the feet, it's impossible. Like we'll never be able to go back to what I mean, we're supposed this to. Is, again, I keep drawing the, the parallel to the, the sugar too. I mean, we form those kids' palates at such a young age that it's, it's crazy. If you just discipline yourself to avoid that stuff now – then you, it won't be that difficult later. No. But try taking a kid who you've allowed to have candy, like I was his whole life. So guess what? I'm 40-something years old, and I've been battling it my whole life because mm. it was something that was accepted and a part of our normal diet versus what I'm seeing now already in my son in his short five years is because I limited that exposure so strictly early on when he couldn't even communicate or talk, and it was easy 
now that he can talk, he does understand what all stuff is. He doesn't have that much of a desire. No. He's already been conditioned. He's already his palate's just, already been trained. Yes. It's too sweet for him. Yes, his brain he's, has been yes, developed. Yes, he takes a point. bite of it and he's like, Oh, I'm good, Dad. Like yeah. that's enough. Like, yeah. And you know, to your point, Justin, with that woman that you said that made her house super uncomfortable. You know, in Okinawa, some of the longest living people live in Okinawa, and there's some traditional houses, many traditional houses there sit that on the still floor. don't have chairs. Yeah, they sit on yeah. the floor. And so these people, well into their nineties are squatting down or sitting on the floor and standing back up. Yeah. I mean, your ability to get down and get back up requires lots of mobility. There's a study for that. There's a study that's one, isn't that one of the one of the uh Because it, what it is it's, it, it, yes, there's a study that shows your all cause mortality uh, is, is risk based off if you can get up. Based off of whether or not you can get up or stand mm -hmm. uh, get up off the floor. It, now why? Because it, it's a pretty damn good measure of overall body mobility and strength. Like mm -hmm. if you could go from the floor to standing without yeah, needing someone to help you. Yeah, no assistance. Or like props. if you're 90 and you can get on the floor and stand up uh, by yourself, you're probably doing okay. Yeah. Less likely your hips gonna uh, break and less likely go you're down to sick that spiral, or weak you know? or yes, totally. Because I don't know very many 90. I'm, I'm known. I haven't known a lot of 90 year olds, but I don't know very many 80 year olds that could get on the floor. On the, you on see the though, like I mean, and we talked about this, like you know, uh, you know pointing out our, our own p p personal flaws, right? Like I, I noticed how quickly I lost the ability to, you know, uh, decelerate in a squat, a jump squat or whatever, right? When I jumped out of the tr truck yeah. and stuff like that, it's like, this is what happens. Like the, the body, if you don't use it, the body will prune yeah. it. It'll say, oh, it's not necessary to do that. So if you stop learning how to get up off the ground and go all that, and bike, cause all you yeah. do is sit in chairs, couches, cars, and you never break 90 degrees, like the body will prune that, and that'll sneak up on you, you know, real quick. You know, it's it's a great example of that. It's so true. It's almost, it's true for every skill. Some skills are more hardwired than others, but it's so true. My cousins uh, were I had I have a bunch of uh, cousins all the same, roughly the same age, bunch of guys, and there was a lot of us that were born here um, and were raised here, and our parents spoke Sicilian or Italian, and we knew it, we understood it, we could you know kind of communicate with it, but it wasn't our primary language at all. So we all grew up, all went to school, went to high school, uh, sophomore year, you know, we're all at the same high school. And then they moved to Sicily. Okay. So I, I don't know, how old are you when you're a sophomore? Four, 15, 15 years old, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they moved. Now, up until 15, English was their primary language. Okay. Moved to Italy. And if I go visit now, 30 years later or whatever, they can still communicate with me to, with English, but their English is almost like, like it's not their primary language. They can speak it. But you could tell they never practice it. They never speak English. They only speak Italian. And their English is almost like, oh, I haven't I don't speak English that often. And let me, you know, it's like they have to get into it. And that's a hardwired thing. Language right. is hardwired. Right, right. It is, and it you is. can see that it's, you know, it's that kind of a trip. Yeah. Anyway, I gotta I gotta ask you guys uh, uh, like a trivia question, see if you guys can guess right okay. on this. I saw a a pictograph or pictographic that I thought was pretty cool. It has a picture of all the all 50 states, and then it lists, I'm gonna open it up here it lists what percentage of, of the people in each state own guns. <laughs> what percentage in each state? Yeah, so like there's states with a high percentage own guns. Sure, of course. With a low, okay. Of course, like a Tennessee is going to have what? like uh, 60% or well, 70% of the Texas people. Let, be up there. let me ask you guys yeah. this. What state do you think, and I bet if you slow down and don't react and think, you'll probably figure this out. Okay. What state do you think has the highest percentage uh, that own guns? The Alaska. Guns? Texas. He, no, he's right. Just he's Alaska, I was going to say Montana. Course, Alaska. Yeah, Alaska. Because his yeah. population is low. So I was thinking Montana. Everybody like has a gun to protect Where is Mont Does it have all of them? Like, what's next? Yes. No. I mean, those are all 50, 40%. All high. Alaska, 61%. Uh, Arkansas, fifty seven percent. They're guess, pretty close. Justin. Yeah. I would have said Montana. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, where am I at with Montana? Uh, it was probably at? a little more popular than Montana, but it was probably close. Uh, twenty seven percent. It's actually oh, less oh, than really? I thought. Yeah, hmm. it's actually less than I thought. You know, um, Alaska makes sense because uh, they have uh, a lot of bears. Grizzly, the, yeah, yeah. yeah, crazy yeah. stuff. And, out there. Yeah, and, and, I, and most a lot people, of towns where you I better carry. Most people yeah. that live or chose to live in Alaska want to live off the grid. And if you want to live off the grid, you are probably going to have to have skills like hunting and fishing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which mean, and you also have obviously predators like bears. It's, more, it's honestly, it's a, it's really utility. Yes. You know, it's, it's less about protection. And it's more like, I have to have this to Just survive. in case. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, that's a, that was what, a good What's grace. crazy about this too is as you look at this, uh, 
you know, when what's you, that? What's the worst? Let's go the other way. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Let's, well, let's, do you, let's yeah, you guys want to guess the worst? Is, yes. is California the is the? Uh, no, it's actually not. I mean, it's low. It's, it's, tw- East it's twenty percent. Don't York? forget, California. A lot of people think California is like ultra liberal. No, everywhere. if you go in this, if you go to Central Valley, it's like California it's is like the coast is super liberal. Yeah. Everywhere else is, it's, is yeah, just yeah, Bay Area. And, so, uh, let, so let's go New York. Uh, let's see. New York is ten percent lower than California. Definitely lower than California. What's the lowest? Uh, Vermont. Rhode Island, 5%. Yeah, 5% yeah, dang, for them. Connecticut, close. New Hampshire, 14%. I would have thought that would have been higher. What is interesting, though, is to see how many Americans own guns. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> I think Americans... And then, and then the, the ones that, that own multiples, like the ones that own just hundreds and hundreds yeah. of them that like bring the average up. You know? isn't, isn't, <laughs> isn't there like, like, cause they, they talk about like, you know, obviously there's a lot of people that want to see us get rid of it, but like it'd be Good impossible, luck. right? No like, way. Impossible. You'd have to, you'd have to have a total police state. You'd have to break into people's homes. You'd have to, it would be, it would cause it, so much it, worse w- problems. It would be a war. Then that gun, even if it wasn't a war, like, like it would cause, like you wouldn't want the government to have that kind of power uh, to even try to take all yeah, the like guns. It, that's that my, would be that's worse. That's my point. In order for that to to to, in, to put a, a law like that in place and impose it, you would literally have to have martial law because the amount of mm-hmm. citizens that have hundreds of guns yeah. and the amount of people that have a gun at least is well, would be so hard to even capture. Well, think about it this way. You'd have all the registered guns. So you'd say, you have until this date to turn, into your, turn your gun in. Otherwise, we're coming for you. So then you'd have a percentage that'd be like, F you. But let's say a majority turn in their guns. So now you have... Still, millions of people who are like, nope. So, like, okay, now we're going to come to your house. Yeah. Okay, maybe you hid the gun. Maybe you didn't. What are they going to do? Throw you in jail? Maybe some people are going to shoot. And then you have illegal guns. So then they're like, how are they going to find all those? You get the politician who's surrounded by people with guns that are protecting them to tell you that you can't have a gun, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I thought that was pretty crazy stuff. That is crazy. It's a lot. I have uh, our shout out today. Um, shout out is uh, Sal DiStefano on Bradley Martin's podcast. That's you can't yeah. shout me out. Yes, I'm I can. On the show. <laughs> yes, I can. That was uh, on on Raw Truth, Raw Talk, Raw, raw talk, talk, not Raw Truth. That was a good time. Yeah. Raw Truth. You know, I got to say, it was a good time. Um, we've met Bradley before. We, we interviewed him. Um, I had a good interview with him. Almost like seven years ago. Is Six that right? years ago. Maybe? Six seven years. Long ago? time ago. Yeah, it was, long time. Um, it was a long time. And ago. then um, you know, he has like this this like social media persona. Um, uh, but when you meet him, it's, he's a, he's a, he's down to earth, super gracious, good guy, great discussion. Um, actually quite deep afterwards, we were talking about certain things. He had his mom come over, um, after the, the oh, podcast. And, yeah. He, she was on the phone and she, you know, his mom's like, Hey, I need you know the code to get in or whatever. And he lets her in and, you know, he can tell he's got a good relationship with his mom. So. Um, but yeah, nice guy, uh, great guy uh, to meet in person, and we had a really good discussion. It was good. Yeah, I thought the discussion was was really good. And then uh, towards the back half, you kind of get into your your journey and Christianity and stuff like that, and you told that story that was really powerful. Um, but overall, a really a really really good Thanks. conversation. Yeah, good, good so stuff. check that out for a listener. If you like grass fed meat, wild caught fish, heritage pork, free range chicken, if you like healthy meat, go to Butcher Box. This company delivers it to your door, and because there's not a lot of middlemen, you save money as well. If you go through our link, butcherbox.com forward slash mind pump, you can choose from filet mignon, ribeyes, or New York strips for free in every box for an entire year. So for an entire year, you get one of those for free, your choice. If you use the code uh, that we give you, by the way, that's on that link, you'll also get an additional $20 off. All right, back to the show. Our first caller is Tanner from Kansas. Hey, Tanner. What's up, Tanner? How can we help you? Well, um, I just want to start by saying thank you for taking my call. And I guess my issue is uh, over the last four years, I've lost 100 pounds, probably rather unhealthily, um, by just adding more, more movement and eating less. And then I found you guys about six months ago. And... Uh, Started just tracking my pre- or my protein and added creatine to my supplements, and I've stayed off the scale for about six months. Uh, and I've added to my strength quite a bit, but then when I got on the scale the other day, I had gained twenty pounds, and it just kind of freaked me out and was um, made me nervous because I didn't want to go back to where I was. 
Okay. Yeah. Now I'm I'm reading your email here. There's some information here that's important uh, to consider as well. It says here that although you gained 20 pounds, your waist stayed the same size. Yeah, my 35 inch jeans is still fit the same. Yeah. That's okay. A, that's and a it, really good sign. That's a very good sign. And then also, Perfect. you saw some huge strength gains. Your one arm overhead press. So with one arm, one have 30 pounds. So that's a that's Whoa. a that's a good uh, you know. 80 pound on a double press, uh, I would say with a barbell. Is that correct? 30 pounds of one arm what, up? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've moved up 30. I, I do a kettlebell workout at home and I just bought a new 10 pound kettlebell. Okay. Every time I felt like I needed to go up. Now, before you, you, you kind of started following our advice, right? Before you started taking the creatine, bumping your protein, strength training, you were on this, uh, you said like unhealthy weight loss kind of path. So what what, did, what were you doing before is, what, I guess, a better question. Um, what I was doing before was basically um, I just cut calories and, and increased movement continuously to try and get the scale to go down. Do you do you have an idea of how much your protein was at before you, you started focusing on increasing it? I'm going to guess maybe 120 grams a day. All right. And now what, what are you hitting now? 180 to 200. Okay. And how, what's, if you don't mind me asking, what's your height and body weight? I'm six foot tall and right now about 230 pounds. Okay. Oh, he's 230. Is that what he said? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, all right. Expected. This would be expected because it sounds like you were on, you were really, really low with your calories, just moving a lot. If you reverse that uh, and your waist stayed the same, I don't know how much of that 20 pounds was muscle, but a lot of it was. Typically with weight gain in men, especially if it's a lot of body fat, you won't see this, the waist stay the same. Yeah, definitely won't. Typically 20 pounds will equate to a significant difference in the waist, uh, inches, not like one inch, but inches, uh, of increase in the waist, at least three or four inches. So even if you're off one or so, uh, I think what you gained was a lot of water, probably glycogen, muscle, a lot of muscle. Maybe a little bit of body fat, but you probably needed to reverse to get the metabolism in gear again. Um, do you know? Do you have an idea of how many calories you're eating now? Also, before before Tanner, before you got on the scale and saw that you were 20 pounds up, before that, how did you feel? Oh, I feel pretty good. I mean, I That's moved cool. better, and and I mean, I I'm happy with everything. It just the, the number on the scale freaked me out. I know you guys say I shouldn't look at that, but I <laughs> yeah. and did. I mean, easier you're, said you're, than done. Right? You're you're the exact example of why we say that because yeah. just like you just said, yeah, it was, ruined your day. I asked how you were <laughs> yeah. doing, and you're like, man, I you're felt good. It. I felt Otherwise. good at him. I was doing great. Got on that damn scale, and then then I felt like this. And the truth is, like that doesn't you know, that doesn't even matter. The fact that you've kept your waist where you're at, your strength has gone up. Uh, you feel better. Uh, you're you're stronger. I mean. Those are all great signs. If you're a client of mine, I'm probably high five and you and saying, bro, we're kicking ass. Let's keep going. And then to get on a scale uh, to allow it to completely just ruin your your day and and you know, make you feel like you're not doing a good job. You're doing a great job. Yeah. Do, do, do you have access to a gym? Do you want to switch programs for away from kettlebell to something else? Um, I work a really weird schedule and a lot of hours. So the best time for me to work out is at home. Okay. Uh, Okay. Like this week, I I gotta work eighty hours. So. Whoo! Oh wow, that's a lot. That would, a lot. It, would you want to follow a suspension program? We have a map suspension. What you would need is a suspension trainer, and then it's a it's a different stimulus. It'd be different from the kettlebells. Yeah, I would be interested in trying that. All right, let me send that to you. But look, here's the deal: if your waist stayed the same. That by the way, that's a significant strength gain in a one arm overhead press. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy yeah. strength. That would be a high strength gain in a deadlift, uh, but in a overhead press with one arm, yeah, substantial. That sure. would that would like roughly be thirty pounds in one arm going up. It's like uh, it would be like somebody adding eighty pounds to their overhead press or more it's crazy. with a barbell. It's crazy. I mean, that's a huge gain. So uh, yeah, so I I mean, a sig you at you gained a lot of muscle. I don't know how yeah. much. Of the of the weight you gained was muscle, but a majority of it, if your waist uh, stayed the same. Did you tell us how many calories you're currently eating and what you came? Do you have from? an idea? Um, I'm gonna guess twenty five hundred probably, but I 
I kind of got away from packing the calories so much just okay. because I didn't like, like like what I was doing. When you were trying, so when okay. when you were losing weight and tracking, what were you hitting? Oh, probably at my lowest, seventeen, eighteen hundred calories. Mm. Okay, okay, that's not yeah. horrific. Did you have like this ideal? exact targeted body weight that you're trying to you know achieve in your mind is it like when you were at a certain weight you felt the best and that's kind of what's sticking in your head well um originally i was 307 pounds so my original goal was to lose 100 so when i got down to 207 that's when i kind of started to refeed myself and and uh just try and do things the right way rather than just looking for a number. Yeah. yeah. What I would what I would look at now, okay, you're hitting your protein targets. And if you're not already doing this, this would be the other thing I would look at is just only eat whole foods. Mm -hmm. Like those two combinations will steer you in the right direction. I, I also want to explain a little bit of what, what you experienced and, and what happened. This is really similar to uh, what happens after I would do a cut for like eight weeks into a show. I'm in a deficit pretty consistently for eight you were in a deficit for a really long time burning 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 that means your your body's completely depleted right it's depleted and it's just utilizing fat primarily as its source of fuel and you've just kept drop drop that. then all of a sudden you go okay uh i hit my goal i uh, listen to mind pump i think i need to increase protein increase calories and you did that and the first like especially a big guy like you seven to 10 pounds was just like water and glycogen, yeah. all positive stuff. Yeah. Just literally because the body out. has been de basically depleted for so long, you gave it what it needed. And so it goes, all the muscle bellies filled up, water, it, water's being held because we got higher calories, all positive stuff. So seven to 10 pounds, like right away after a show, I put on immediately. And it's not body fat. It was just literally water and glycogen filling my body, my body and my muscles up. So that's, a, and then, and then the other 12 pounds, Based off of the inches on your waist and the strength, I would probably say a good percentage, if not all of it, was mostly muscle. Yeah. So you're, I, and if so, if you're a client and we're training, I actually would say I kind of want you to s keep doing what you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. I kind of like where wherever you're landing calorie wise, even though you're not tracking, it sounds like you're in a, a good place, healthy. I love the fact that you're mainly making sure you hit your protein intake, and, and that probably the the next best strategy for us would be kind of where Sal was going, which is, hey, sounds like you've been doing this kind of kettlebell routine for a long time. If you're open to changing the stimulus, I think you're going to see huge benefits from that. Now that you're giving the body the proper amount of calories and protein, changing the stimulus to kind of shock the body, to use a bro term, would be a great idea right now to keep adding muscle and potentially leaning out yeah. more. So uh, whatever you're open to, do you have, like, what's the what's your home setup like? Do you have barbells or dumbbells, or is it just literally some kettlebells? I have a few small dumbbells, some bands, and a whole bunch of kettlebells. So that's kind of... I kind of went crazy on those for a while. Okay. okay. Have, yeah. you know, hey, Doug, send them over kettlebells for aesthetics, too. Yeah. And yeah. suspension. We have a, we have a pro, two, yeah, two suspension, great suspension trainer too. and kettlebells for aesthetics, uh, yeah. I think, would be a cool. How, last question. How do you feel now versus uh, how you felt before, uh, you know, with the strength gain and all this stuff? It's just feeling good. Oh, I feel, feel like a whole new person. So you feel I mean, better than you did when you were 20 pounds lighter when you started this? Yeah. Yeah, and I feel... A thousand times better than when I was 300 pounds. Yeah. Yeah, you're in the right direction, Tan. I wouldn't worry. I wouldn't worry at all. And in fact, I had a client once that uh, they went on a pretty extreme weight yeah. loss. Then they hired me and they had all their blood marker tested because they were doing this weight loss uh, program with their doctor. Then they hired me. They got their blood tested again at a heavier body weight with me because we built muscle, did the whole mm -hmm. thing. And their blood lipid profile got better. Their inflammatory markers got better. Their insulin sensitivity got better. Uh, because of the muscle they gained. So, I mean, you're moving in the right, you're definitely moving in the right direction. The fact that your waist didn't go up yeah. is the biggest indication to me that th this is this is all good. Yeah. Okay, well, that's, I appreciate that. And it, like I said, it's, it's probably all in my mind. It's not really anything to worry about, but I, I appreciate you guys getting back with me and, and your input. Yeah, you you're, do, it, you're doing good, yeah. Tanner. Stay the course, man. All right, thank you. All right, thank man. you. You know, waist circumference is not a bad measurement to track. It's a great one. Remember, yeah, Doug, yeah. that's Doug's MO. Yeah, I know. I mean, yeah. That's all he really I mean, pays but attention to. Like, if I gain 20 pounds and my waist didn't go up, 
Like she has. I gained a lot success. of success. Yeah, yeah, I, I know that's good. Thing. It's it, it has to be. That doesn't happen. You don't add twenty pounds as a male and not put anything to. No, not your, even your, as a woman. Even though women don't gain as much around their waist, yeah, they typically no. we see waist go up. Well, that's that's why I, I just don't really care like how much I weigh. You know, it's like it's all how you feel and how strong you are. And if if his joints are like inflamed, he's like you're you know, right. He's yeah. in pain or something. Like that's that would different. be a concern. But who cares about? how much I mean, you weigh? That, it's funny because he, he he knows he hears us say that on the podcast. But that's this is the exact reason like oh. literally he goes oh people I, would come i in, feel but... good i'm feeling yeah. great i yeah. feel stronger i feel healthy. my waist is good that number just deflated yes. his entire idea yes yeah. and i guess you know uh that's why i wanted to bring up the the competing thing it, it's it's fascinating um but you remember this is a, this was a 300 pound guy coming down to it so he's, yeah. not, he's not a small guy he's a big no. dude like big dude right and if he's been in a cut for like a year, low, low calorie. I mean, he is used to being in the in the in the bodybuilding world. We call this flat, right? Yeah. So he's, yep. his muscle bellies on that big old body is all depleted and low, and that's what's kept so him like a from towel that was ringed out. Yeah, yeah, and and then now that the first couple meals he ate just went <laughs> and filled them all up. That would easily put eight to ten pounds on my body right away. Just the meal, which you don't get eight to ten pounds of fat mm -hmm. from that. You literally just fill up all the muscle bellies, and so easily he got eight. To 10 pounds just from that alone and then what i think happened is he probably built some he f started giving his body the amount of protein it yep. needed he's been lifting weights consistently it, his body said thank you now we're gonna go build muscle for all this work you've been doing now that you're giving it the nutrients it needs and he probably put mostly all muscle on especially when you hear mm -hmm. what's going on strength wise in his waist our next caller is jake from pennsylvania what's up jake how can we help you hey guys how's it going what's good. up buddy? pretty good man what's what's happening not a whole lot, man. Just got a couple questions for you. It's nice to finally talk to you guys. I've been a fan of your guys' show for since 2019, and man, you guys have changed my life. So thank you so much. Awesome. That's great, brother. Thank you. Red. What you got for us? Absolutely. All right. So I'm getting married in October. Congratulations. Uh, nine and a half weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you. So over the years, I've gained about 80 or so pounds since 2020, since the pandemic. And a lot of that's because of being overworked, stressed out, anxiety. Um, and I used food to kind of cope with those mechanisms. And it didn't help that I had a really awful trainer experience who ran me through the floor. So it just kind of destroyed my metabolism. So I'm now I went from 200 to 283 where I'm at now. And so my question is one, how should my programming be now dealing with all this stress and the nine weeks coming up for the wedding? And I honestly, I just want to get healthy. Um, I understand that losing a bunch, a bunch of weight right now is not ideal. I'm not going to go in with a six pack set of abs in nine weeks being 280. So I think all that I want is to go into this wedding looking the healthiest and the best I can within the next nine weeks and then use those habits to continue to grow afterwards. Good. So good. The, I'm glad you said right. what you said. Uh, yes, because the truth is the wedding doesn't matter. I, yeah, and I'll yeah, tell yeah. you what, 99.9% .9 of the time, and I'm only saying that because I actually can't even remember 1% when this actually worked. So maybe 100% of the time, somebody said, I want to get in shape for my wedding. They fell right out of shape afterwards. <laughs> I've never had a success story where it was like, this is my target date. And yeah. Then, yeah. And then it kept going. And then it kept that. going. Yeah. It's always it's a disaster. So, all right. Uh, um, with the, what you're saying with stress and all that stuff, I think MAPS 15 yes. is going to be your program. Yeah. I think follow MAPS 15. That'll be your workout. And then I want you to try and get, get some sleep. Try and get good sleep. Are, how is your sleep situation? Yeah. Uh, sleep is not that great. Um, I usually get about six and a half. I usually get up around four 30 to work out. Um, I actually just started maps 15 this week. Cause I just listened to one of your recent podcasts about how much you should work out. I was like, damn, I think my volume is still a little too high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I knocked it down to maps 15 and just started that this week. What time you go to bed? Uh, between nine 30 and 10. Can you go to bed at I'm usually sleep by two. I try, uh, but with, so I've also been working on a music career and rehearsals kind of run a little late throughout the week. Okay. So 
it's hard to balance the music life and a full time job. And yeah. uh, how old are you? Justin gets that. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm 27. Not anymore. Mm -hmm. All right, you're young. You're about to get married. No kids. No, not yet. Not yet. All right. So this is, this is a good time to play the game of how hard you can push yourself <laughs> because when you have kids and you get older, <laughs> <laughs> it's not as easy. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say, look, when you start to feel like, ah, shit, I'm getting run down, string together two or three nights of good sleep. Okay. Because here's what's going to happen. Okay. If you don't do that, it's going to hurt your everything, your pursuits at work, your pursuits with your music uh, endeavors. And then it'll hurt a lot of other things. MAPS 15 is the right program. Sleep is real important. But at your age, you could probably go a little while. Then you start to feel burnt out. Like two, Typically, two nights of good sleep tends to get you back on track. So you, you just tell the guys or your, your, yeah. whoever you're, you're with and say, hey, look, I got to finish it this time tonight. And, uh, and then I'll be, I'll be able to come back, you know, even stronger, you know, type of deal. I get, I get the attitude yeah. though. I was like that a lot at your age as well. And just, and just kept pushing it. Um, there are consequences, <laughs> but, but I think again, right now yeah. is the time, the time to do it, but don't do more than maps 15. I, I think that's, that's where you'll make a big mistake is if you go over that. Okay. And then diet wise, your, your, your best bet is just whole natural foods because you know, with lack of sleep and stress, you're going to mm -hmm. have a lot of cravings. You're going to want to eat garbage. You're going to want to eat heavily processed food. If you throw that on top of everything else, oh boy, yeah. it's going to make load, things load difficult. Load up on your protein. Do you, uh, do what you kind have of therapist are you using? Cause I want to know, are you using, are you going to like a traditional therapy? Are you doing a nutritionist? Who's helping you right now with that? I see that you, you said that in the question. Yeah. So I did start therapy a little bit ago. She was based out of Michigan. She's actually technically a life coach because she can't, be my therapist out, out of her state. Yeah. I, I so understand. she was, just, um, so she was just helping me out and she actually recommended I see somebody locally like once a week because of family history and stuff like that. But unfortunately that's just not financially feasible at the moment. So I'm just kind of off the therapy for right now until I can get back on track. Hmm. You have a spiritual practice. Yes, I do. Good. Are you you practice it regularly? I try my best to. Yeah. That 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 look the data shows it has a profound impact. If that's something that you if that's a direction you're willing to go, that that can have a profound impact on uh, a lot of the mental health issues and challenges that people run into. I just I've been looking at the data at that a lot recently, and spiritual practice and spiritual guidance oftentimes, especially if you belong to a church, is free. Um, so mm -hmm. I would, I would, you know, lean into that, uh, because, uh, therapy can be expensive and if insurance doesn't cover it, it can yes. be difficult uh, at times. And, and the truth is if you've already connected the dots that <clears throat> you are using food to cope with a lot of these things, um, and we don't address that root cause, we can, we can give you all the best sleep advice, workout yeah. routine advice we want, and it's just going to rear its ugly head. And so, you know, I would probably spend more time talking to you about that than I even would yeah. diving into your, you know, programming. And, and I mean, you got that is what's going to cause this all to come back if we For don't sure. if we don't work on that. So yeah. honestly, yes, reducing volume, yes, trying to get better sleep, all important things. But mm -hmm. most importantly, is probably working through those things that trigger you to use food as a coping mechanism. So I think that um, I can't stress enough how important it is to really focus on that uh, as your primary focus, because then and only then will the other things really start to fall in line. And even if we do give you a temporary, hey, we help you lose 10 pounds right now, uh, if we don't address mm -hmm. that, it's it's all going to come back and yeah, some. totally. Are you excited yeah. about getting married? Oh, absolutely. Very excited. <laughs> you want to have You want to have kids? Very excited. Yes, uh, yes, I do. All right, I'm I'm excited to be a dad someday. This helps. This helps a lot of young men, okay? Because men can be driven by some different things than I think uh, than oftentimes women are driven by. And what helped me a lot mm -hmm. through some big challenges was to try to be the man that I want my kids to be raised by, and to try to be the man that I want my wife to be married to. So when you're in those tough moments and challenges. Raise yourself up. All right. Do I want to be the man that I'd want my daughter to, 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 to date? Do I want to be the kind of man that raises my children? 
And that, for a lot of men, can be enough to just get them on the right track and to keep them in the right track. Yeah. So maybe maybe use that as well as, as a little bit of motivation. You, you have an opportunity to be a generational character in your family, to break a cycle mm -hmm. that potentially might be there. Make that a priority. The rest, the rest of the stuff will start to yeah. fall into place, mm -hmm. brother. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's mostly why I haven't quit my job yet. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of work you do? Uh, I'm a painter for a custom cabinetry shop oh. over here. Oh. So I do all the painting and stuff. And it's it's not hard work, but it's not easy work. I'll put it that way. It's very annoying. It's very particular. <laughs> you got to be, everything's got to be right. So it's very stressful in the sense of that. And lately we've been doing jobs for bigger clients. So the due dates are getting tighter. Higher pressure. And the jobs are getting more complicated. And I'm, I'm just one guy. So like, it's kind of hard yeah. to do everything at once. Yeah. It's honest work though. That's good. Well, yeah, mass yeah, mass fifteen, brother. That's that's the that's the workout program, and then just try to reduce, you know, use caffeine judiciously, um, and I'd stay away from depressants like alcohol and marijuana mm -hmm. to help bring yourself down. Those can really reduce the quality of your sleep, um, and then you're. I think you're going to be okay. You're young, so this is kind of the time when you kind of grind a little bit. Maybe that uh, bluegrass yeah. band is going to take off. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, what kind of music? You, what kind of music? Bluegrass. You do? Is it bluegrass? Uh, country. Actually. Oh, yeah. I almost yeah, called it. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Hell Sorry yeah. to disappoint you, Justin. Yeah, Sorry. That's all right. Yeah. I, I still. I we're hey, it. we're slowly converting him, bro. We're slowly yeah. converting. Hey, hey, I never well, thought I'd like yeah. that music. Hey, as long as it ain't I that like pop country stuff, you yeah. I actually have a song coming out next week. Nice. Oh yeah, my first song ever. Oh, shout yeah. it out! Shout it out, then, Jake. Tell us. Maybe it'll go viral. It's called "Loving on Overtime" by Jake Groft. <laughs> I like that. All right, there you go, <laughs> brother. Like Jake, that. are you in our forum, Love right? It. Yes, sir. I am. Hey, when yeah, I own pretty much all your guys' stuff. So <laughs> when that song goes up, I want you to post it in the forum and tag us. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, man. Will do. I, right. I'll absolutely. And do. Adam will be musicians. very honest. If it's good, he'll tell you. <laughs> if it sucks, he'll tell you. He can't I, help. I appreciate yeah, honesty, no man. All right. All right, good stuff. All right, that's, that's that's how I got where I am. Yeah. I didn't get through here without honesty. So. All right, good man. All right, Jake. All right, right brother. On, well, good luck. Thank you guys so much. You got it. You guys man. have a good rest of your day. You too. You too. I like Jake. He's got to stay farm. He's got to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, uh, I mean, he's on the right path. He's doing Mass 15, you know. But six six hours, five, six hours, six and a half hours a night. Yeah. That, that, it's that tough. makes it hard. Yeah. It makes it very hard to do anything. And if you throw hard workouts hard on top of it. hard to fully recover. You're going to, yeah, you'll screw yourself up. So something has to give. But, you know, I remember when I was in my 20s, like, you know, that, that was a time when you kind of see what you're made of and you push yourself and, mm -hmm. and you know, things will change later as he has kids and stuff. If you can handle it, yeah, right now is the best time. But you got to get that reprieve because you don't want to shut your body down. Yeah, right? I can't stress enough the inner stuff. You can't, if you can't, uh, of course, if you can't get to the bottom of that or fix that, then everything is hard. Everything. Yeah. Everything becomes hard. And so and that'll fix, never change unless that's right. you address that's right. it. Yeah. You know, so uh, addressing that and working on that and fixing that, which by the way, I, I know how difficult it is if yep. you, if you've been raised a certain way and it was built into you to to break that cycle, you said it well, that. man. It's really hard, really hard. So good luck, buddy. Yep. Sorry to interrupt you. Right now, Maps GLP One is available. Brand new program for those of you taking a GLP One. It's a workout. We we'll help you with your diet, your supplements, behavior modifications. It's the only workout program designed for people on a GLP One on the market. And of course, it's amazing because it's brand new. Get it for seventy dollars off. Plus, get two free eBooks. The first one is the ultimate medication guide for patients and practitioners. The second one is the intuitive nutrition guide. Go to mapsglp1.com. Use the code GLP70. Get $70 off plus those free ebooks. All right, back to the show. Our next caller is Brianna from Ontario. Hi, Brianna. How you doing, Brianna? How can we help you? Hi, guys. How are you? Good. Good. Were you on the trainer call, trainer call last night? Did you make that? Did I which? Did you make the trainer call last night? Were you there with Sal and I and the trainers? No, I don't even know about it. Oh, wow. We had a free those are the things I need to know. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. I see you're a new trainer. And we'll be we doing a, those monthly. Yeah, free webinar, and they got to be making those for sure. Well, hey, maybe we can help you now. What's going so, on? 
Yeah, I just found you guys about a month ago. So I'm even brand new to your podcast. So I need all the information on what I should be doing. Awesome. So uh, brand new trainer in the sense that I've had a handful of clients. Like it's it's new. I've only been in it about six months. And my first experience was at a big box gym. And I had a client who was severely overweight. She was ready to make changes. She signed up for me for uh, once a week for three months, I think was her first sign up. And I met with her on a Friday and went over everything, her goals. Uh, I put everything together and nutrition plan, you know, you're going to work out, she was going to work out twice on her own and once with me. So I went through everything with her and I said, okay, we start Monday, like, let's get this done. And the following week, she didn't come in for any of her sessions and I couldn't really communicate with her. So I went to management and they said, yeah, you just went, you know, too quick, too soon, too much. So I said, okay, yeah, I'm brand new. Like, teach me. What what do we need to do here? How do I approach this better? And their philosophy was, um, okay, next week we're going to get her to eat an apple. And the week after that, we're going to introduce an extra liter of water. And the week after that, we're going to start her on the treadmill. Like, it was just this really slow progression. And I didn't agree with it. So I ended up parting ways with that gym. Not any kind of animosity. I still speak to all of them. Um, I just don't feel like I was able to be my true self in that, in that situation. So now I'm, I'm doubting whether coaching is even for me, um, because I have the mentality of like, let's get shit done. It, it starts Monday. You need change. Change is hard, but change is growth. Um, and that wasn't well, re- well received, I guess. So my question is, is the industry soft in the sense that trainers are supposed to be coddling a little bit more and having that participation ribbon mentality or is it just a personal growth thing for me where i can maybe find a happy medium between the two yeah brianna have you have you have you listened to us long enough to trust us yet like are you are you absolutely okay absolutely you want, I, got, I got good and i got bad news for you <laughs> yeah, yeah which one do you i want, want all first? of it okay <laughs> i'll start with the good news sandwich well, yeah. i'll start with the good news you have a zest and a passion for this i could tell yeah uh, I can tell you do because of the attitude that you have, and it's a very common attitude that trainers and coaches have when they first get in the industry. Now, the bad news is it's the wrong one. It's <laughs> it's going to you are going to fail, uh, uh, and you're going to fail okay. miserably with your clients it, with that kind of of attitude that I'll, you have. Also, want to re- tell you this: we were there too, hundred yep. okay, percent. So we we okay. we have a, so I that, came in guns we had blazing. Very, too, we had a very me. similar mindset at coming into being a trainer that had to shift and yeah. go ahead. Sal, so there, so yeah. there, there's a, and re- I want to shift. Like I want to make the change because I truly want to help people. Yes. So. Thank yeah. you. You yep. said it. There it is. Okay. You want to help people in order to help people. You have to be as effective as possible, not as hard as possible, not as soft as possible, not as, you know, charismatic as possible. None, none of that. It doesn't matter. Whatever it is that's effective is what you need to become as a coach, your job is to guide these people. When you're dealing with a severely overweight person who's been battling th- with this for their entire lives, this is very hard for them. It might not be hard for you. You might have all the answers. You probably do have all the answers. But for them, you're you're dealing with behavior changes, long-term behavior changes that are very hard. This individual that you were working with is probably well aware of the fact that they're severely overweight. It's probably causing them a lot of emotional and physical pain. They know that their health is bad. They know they need to make all these changes. They just can't. They just can't. You can't do it. Now, I know you might think, yes, you can, but no, they can with the right guidance. And the way you guide them is you meet them where they're at. So if they say to you, I can only work out once a week, the answer that you have back to that is perfect. We'll start one day a week. If they say to you, I want to work out one day a week and I don't even want to look at my nutrition. The answer from you is fine. You're not going to get there as fast, but that's okay. You let me know when you're ready. And this guiding approach, this very, and it's not soft. It's not coddling. Coddling is lying. Okay. You need, you can be honest. I'm all, I was very honest with my clients. Hey, why am I not getting results any faster? Yeah. Well, we're you're not, e- you're eating one apple. That's yeah, it. We're, we're, yeah. We're, there's a lot of things that <laughs> we're not, all you're doing. So don't yeah. worry. <laughs> there's a lot of things that we're not doing right now. So on a lot. we're not going to see the results that you, you want right now. However, we're moving at the speed that I think is appropriate. And if you want to move faster, we can do that. But I will ask you this, whatever you're doing is what you need to maintain. And the most difficult thing is not losing the weight. It's keeping it off. And how do you keep the weight off? 
one small step at a time. There's two ways that that you see long-term success when it comes to any big change, whether it's a personal change, emotional change, or weight loss, which is a big deal. Remember, to go from you know overweight to fit means a lot of things have had to change fundamentally in that person. It's not just their weight that changed. There's a lot of things within them that changed. There's two ways it can happen. One is with an epiphany. This is the like, oh my God, I had a, a miracle moment or this light bulb went off or something big happened. That is very rare. Yeah. In fact, epiphanies don't even happen when people have a heart attack One out of a or when they months. get you know diagnosis of cancer or get divorced or whatever. Even those don't cause epiphanies. So that's rare. So forget that. Let's throw that away. The other way is slow chipping away progress and change because whatever you change, you have to, you know, you got to challenge yourself. So don't get me wrong. Every change that they make needs to be challenging. Otherwise it's meaningless. You don't get to determine by the way, what's challenging they do, but it also needs to be something that they feel they can maintain realistically for the rest of their life. Whatever that step is, is okay. So if that step is eating one apple, then that's where we're going to start. If that step is I drink an extra glass of water, then that's where we're going to start. And I'm telling you right now, Brianna, this is your, this is coming from three uh, very experienced trainers. This understanding is what took me from, you know, most of my clients gaining the weight back to becoming extremely successful with my clients. It was this right here. This is what made the big difference the, the, right here. It's going to be so much in the other direction too that you're going to find yourself doing this as you get more experience too. Someone comes in, they're all excited. They're like, oh, Brian, uh, I'm I, ready to do this. I'm ready to change my life. Give me the diet. Give me the plan. I'll do mm -hmm. five days a week. I'll do seven if you tell me. And you're going to have to talk them the opposite yeah, way. And say no. Bring you're going to say, I don't, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think you're ready for that. I think... You've done nothing for six years, and what I don't want to do is get you in here five days a week, and it then overwhelms you, and then you go back the other direction. So why don't we start with something that you know you can commit to for the rest of your life? This isn't just to get you to lose thirty pounds. This is some. This is a lifestyle change. I'm going to help you do, and in order to be effective, we want to make sure that whatever we commit to, it's something that you can do forever. So I know you're highly motivated right now, and you're telling me you want to work out five, seven days a week, but I need you to see yourself in two, three, five years from now and tell me what is something you can see yourself consistently doing and actually talking them back and then maybe working them up over time, but you'll find yourself doing that more. And we, I'm telling you, we came in the same way. We came in hot like you, excited <laughs> to help people, which is a good thing, like Sal said. like That is an awesome thing to have that you're, you, you have the right North Star. You want to help people. But the way we go about it is a lot different than what we thought when we first started. And uh, I'm going to have Doug email you privately after we get off this call because we literally just closed enrollment for our training course. And uh, this is what we talk about in there. Like, this is the type of stuff that no national certifications ever covered for any of us. Had that, a coach proper, effectively. Yeah, yes. And, th and this is the difference of you being a good coach and a great coach is learning how to do this with individuals. This is what we go deep in. And so yeah. I definitely would love to see you in there going through that with yeah, us. Yeah, and, and consider this too, Brianna. You're in the fitness space for a reason. You're doing this now as a career. You love it. The kind of people that respond well to the messaging of the fitness industry that says things like, um, you know, beast mode, all or nothing, pick your hard, you know, that kind of stuff is fitness fanatics. It's us. We love that <laughs> shit. That's why we do yeah, this. Yeah. yeah it but resonates with us. You're not going to be training fitness fanatics. Very, there's going to be yeah. very few of your clients that are going to become trainers after you're done with them. Most of them are not living for fitness, but they're going to use fitness to improve the quality of their life. So you have to learn how to communicate to them. You're not communicating to yourself. And then just to give you a little bit of perspective, you don't have to tell me what this is, but just think to yourself, are there challenges you have in your life that you've been struggling with for a long time that somebody on the outside will look at you and go, that's easy, just do this. And you say to yourself, oh, I know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what they're doing. Yeah. So imagine if you somebody came in your life, looked at your hard struggle, and you know what to do, and they looked at you and said, well, just do it. Well, thanks, genius. No, no shit. Like, I need help. <laughs> I need guidance. Like, I need, I need to do this in a way that works. That's what you're dealing with with people. Like, weight loss, keeping it off, this, these are changing fundamental behaviors. For most people, this is a major personal transformation, and that never happens just by getting the instructions and the answers. It just doesn't work that way. So- and what you're what you're noticing, what you're considering as a new trainer, 
is what all good new passionate trainers go through. All of them. Yeah. So uh, I think I think you would really. You're gonna you're gonna yeah. love. We have so much good content. You're gonna love oh. that's like around this conversation right here because I really do think this is what separates. Totally. Good, well, and trainers. you recognizing this early is gonna give you such an advantage, you know, over a lot of new trainers coming in that don't really even see that as an, as something that they can improve upon. And so, yeah, yeah once you really kind of wrap your head around the fact that you know communicating to these people that don't think like you and, and being able to peer into their uh, experience a little more effectively and just give them just what they need uh, is going to set you apart. Yeah. Bree, I, I, you've only been listening to uh, the show for a month, so you've probably have not heard this story. I've only, I've told it probably five times on the podcast, but I'll let you know the turning point for me. And it was a big one. It was a hard one. And it haunts me to this day. I had a woman who I trained, I trained her husband and I trained her separately and she would keep a food log for me. And she'd write down everything she ate and she kept body, body fat kept going up and the scale kept going up and we couldn't figure out what was going on. Well, her husband confided in me that she wasn't writing everything down in her food log. So I, with the same attitude that you have, like do this or not or whatever, I thought we're going to have a tough conversation. This is my mentality. And she came in and I sat her down and I confronted her and I hammered her. And I said, look, you're, it's impossible to be gaining weight on the, wood, on the food that you're reporting. If that were the case, then we need to study you. That's literally what I told her because you're defying the laws of physics. Tell me the truth. And she broke down and she told me the truth of what was going on. And she cried and she, and she, and she left came back. and I felt so satisfied and she never came back. She uh. never came back. And up until that point, regardless of her diet, she was still seeing me two days a week. And you know what I probably did? I probably pushed her away from fitness for the rest of her life. She had an experience yeah. with a trainer that made her feel like a piece of crap that told her that she was, you know, lying and dumb and, you know, don't even do this and don't waste your time. So she yeah. probably never came back. And I, I probably ruined that woman's life because I did it the wrong way. And that's when everything switched for me and I became far more successful with my clients. So I share that story for two reasons. One, I think it communicates what we're saying. And two, because I hope one day she hears this. And, and she hears how sorry I am. And I hope she comes back to the fitness space. <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible advice. Uh, the walk back thing. And I think that's rookie mistake what I did because she did come to me, you know, ready to go. And I want to make all these changes. And I probably should have identified that. Hang on. We need to take maybe five steps totally. back and start. Totally. Meet her where she's at. Right. Totally. I think that's really important and the, information. And the Thanks. way you communicate that, as you say, I'm so glad you're excited. A lot of people get motivated. They come to me in this way. Here's what I want to do. I want to start you off two days a week. Well, why? I want to do five because your body's going to respond better this way. In my experience, this is a much more successful approach. Trust me, yeah, we will we have an opportunity. Build off of this and we're going to build off of this, but I want to see you you know, two days a week or whatever. I want to start with just these changes right here. And don't worry, your body will change with just these changes. And we'll have those other things in our back pocket. Trust me. I think that's the way you want to present it. You're, you're going to find yourself doing that a lot more a lot. than you would have thought. Like yeah, that, yeah. Was the, that was a very huge shift in my career of realizing that and going from the example Sal gave of how I kind of blew a lot of people out the door, like either you're ready for this or you're not commit type of deal. And then I realized like, oh, wow, there's so many people that are not just ready for that. And it's because that's not how I, I'm the type, which is probably like you, who I respond well to that. Like, you know, call me mm -hmm. out, call me on my bullshit, Absolutely. you know, challenge yeah. me. You know what I'm saying? Like that's, I need that. I like that. But to Sal's point earlier is like, we're not training people like us at all. We're right. training people that despise working out many times and don't like doing this and have struggled. They don't have a good relationship with Yeah, them. struggled for decades with their relationship with food and exercise right. and body image. And it's like, man, that is a very slow, a gradual process. But successful if you do it right. That's right. That's right. You start stacking the wins. I, but we have so much good stuff around this, Brianna. I'm excited. I'm going to have Doug, too, send you over some of the webinars that we've already done where we've talked in depth with some of this stuff, some things you'll really benefit from. So look forward to hopefully seeing you in there with us. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I'm willing to learn, and I want to learn as much as I can. So I appreciate it. Thank you. You got, got it. You. Right on. Yeah. Got you. Thanks for calling in. No problem. Thanks for having me. Bye, guys. Yep. Bye. Bye. God, I love these conversations because, you know, if she applies this, you can tell she yeah. wants it. She loves this. If she applies this, like, she's going to change some lives. So much more effective. In a positive way. Yeah. But this is the biggest, this is, of all the mistakes that trainers can make, I'm going to say this very confidently, <laughs> yeah. this is the biggest one. This is this is the big newbie one. I mean, this is the so biggest common. one, and a lot of trainers never get out of it. 
No. They, they mean well. That's why. That's yeah. right. They mean yeah. well. Yeah. It's it's coming from a good place. Like she's yeah. not coming from a place of like I have no respect for these no. people. They're bitches. They're this that. It's more like. The, you know, that's how she would respond. Yeah. Just like yep. me too. I, I would do better with someone like her who tells me like, Adam, you're lying. You're bullshit. Yeah. Like, you know, calling me out like, ah, but that's not most people. No. Most people are not like us. No. And so yeah, they shut down. And always remember you're training another person, not yourself. Right. But you know, that was Doug, by the way, Doug literally came to me and told me he wanted to work out. Was it four days a week or five days a week? And I told him, no, we're doing two days a week. I literally said, no, we're doing now. It wasn't a commitment thing. It was just a strength training programming thing. And then, of course, the rest is history. So, Our next caller is Dave from California. Dave, what's going on, man? What's up, Dave? How can we help you? Hey, how's it going? Uh, first of all, just wanted to say thanks for having me on and thanks for all the uh, for putting fitness out there for everyone to uh, hear and see. Uh, we really appreciate it. So thank you very much. I've been the listener for the last couple of years. Awesome. You got it, man. Right on, Dave. So should I just go ahead and start my ask my question? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, go for it. All right, Sal, I'm asking you uh, because you're probably the most familiar with the situation I'm in. I'm not discounting any input from anybody else in the group, and I'm open to their suggestions as well. I'm a former natural bodybuilder, having competed in the 1990s, and I've been training since 1981. Over the years, I've developed joint issues uh, from overuse of joints, elbows, shoulders, and knees most likely due to bad training form, as well as injuries from six car accidents and not tapping out in jujitsu competitions fast enough when I've been armbarred. And I've also had my shoulder dislocated a couple of times. I've been doing Brazilian jujitsu since 2008, minus the four years during the pandemic when I was taking care of my father who has health issues. During COVID, I did quite a bit of a uh, hit training five times a week. Uh, but stopped in November to focus more on actual weight training. As of December 2023, I'm back doing BJJ, currently a brown belt, but at 57 years old, my recovery abilities aren't what they used to be, so I train Gi Jiu-Jitsu three times a week on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then I've been lifting three times a week, doing full body on my non-Jiu-Jitsu days, and then I have a rest day. Recently, I felt weaker in my lifts and took a deload week off. However, when I came back, my strength really didn't come back. I just bought anabolic, MAPS Anabolic and thinking maybe I should move from three weight training days to two. Additionally, since I'm doing BJJ on non-weight training days, is it necessary to do trigger workouts and trigger sessions since BJJ is pretty much a full body workout? If I'm overtraining, should I reduce BJJ down to two days a week? which I really don't want to do. Um, my goal is to get better in grappling, but to also get stronger. I'm the type of person that doesn't like to skip workouts, whether it's jujitsu or weight training. As a side note, last year I suffered from sleeplessness, low energy, lethargy, low libido, but kept working out. In November, I had my hormone levels checked and my thyroid stimulating hormone was 2.83, which is considered normal. My follicle stimulating hormone was 20.7, which is considered high. My luteinizing hormone was 5.6, which was normal. And my free testosterone was 368, which is on the lower end of normal. Due to the free testosterone level falling in the normal range, my endocrinologist didn't want me to go on TRT. So I decided to second opinion his opinion with my father's doctor, who said that my doctor was treating the chart and not me as a patient saying that low for me, you know, that could be low for me, even though it fell within the normal range. However, my endocrinologist wouldn't budge. I added cold showers and ice dips and I'm now sleeping better, feel more energized, libido's returned, but my strength, not so much. It's gone up some, but uh, not to where it was maybe a year and a half ago. Since initially submitting this, I've gone through a full cycle of MAPS anabolic and was able to gain back some of my strength. I also decided to do your 30-day fitness program that you guys had on placed on YouTube a few years ago. Um, I'm 5'8", 170 pounds. My protein intake is roughly 150 to 200 grams of protein daily with uh, 2,000 to 2,500 calories um, each day. I just bought MAPS 15 last month, and I'm wondering if I should adjust my program to doing MAPS anabolic two days a week on my 
BJJ training days and use my off days for recovery and trigger sessions, or maybe switch over to Mass 15. Your insight would be appreciated. Yeah, this is a pretty easy answer. Yep, one day a week. Yeah, either one day a week of strength training or Mass 15. That would be it. So, okay. you, yeah, you do a full body workout. 45 minutes to an hour once a week. If you if you do jiu-jitsu three days a week, it would be one day a week of strength. But just so you know, by the way, in my late 20s, competing in jiu-jitsu, I had to figure this out myself. So I brought it all the way down to one day a week, and I was able to do jiu-jitsu three to four days a week, and that was about it. If I did more than that strength training-wise, I would notice performance uh, drops. Especially with someone like you, Dave, with your background as a natural bodybuilder, You've got so much muscle memory, so much strength potential. <clears throat> I think one day a week, you'll see your strength really start to bounce back. Or Mass 15 style, which is like 15 minutes a day or 20 minutes a day of a couple core lifts. I think that would be it with your with your three days a week of jiu-jitsu. <clears throat> All right. Um, additionally, if I'm just going to do the one day a week, should I just kind of alternate uh, the the uh, workout from the uh, MAPS anabolic program. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be great. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you could alternate between foundational wor workout one, foundational workout two and foundational workout three. And I would play around with the reps, you know, for a few weeks, just like, just like the programs laid out phase one, phase two, phase three style workouts. I think that's perfectly fine. The other thing is with your testosterone, um, I'd want you to go, go through our partners at mphormones.com and talk to them. Um, and give them your labs, tell them your symptoms at your age. They're likely to put you on testosterone replacement therapy, which is, that'll be a game changer. They, they will, especially with what you, you, the second, the second doctor was right. The second doctor was right with what he said, which was that your other doctor is just treating the chart. You clearly have all these symptoms of low T based off of what you said. And you're low enough that, uh, a doc, a, 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 probably a more, I, I don't know, a doctor that's up with the, the newest research would be okay yeah, with putting you on it. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, to be honest, also, Dave, if you reduced your training, your testosterone probably is going to go up a little bit naturally. It's probably oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's probably depressed from all the overtraining. Look, here's the other thing, too. Just I, I, th I could tell a lot by your personality, by what you're saying and your personality. You were a competitive bodybuilder. You have all these overuse injuries. You don't like to tap out in jiu-jitsu competition. I can I, I can I can make a safe safe guess that you tend to overdo things. Is that yeah? Are you are you balls kind of bare through everything? Is that you? Yeah, you know what? My wife all she says that I I tend to be obsessive about certain things. So yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, yeah. In order to be a a, a competitive bodybuilder, you have to be obsessive. And then if you're not tapping out in, in tournaments, <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah, what the yeah, hell, yeah. man? You know what? Sometimes I think I can get out of that arm bar yeah. by, you know, obviously, you know, moving my, my body around. So that's what I try to do. And once I realize that uh, I can't I can't get out, you know, they're hipping into that arm bar. Oh. Yeah. And then you hear yeah. the crack. It's, it's starting to cause that stress. Oh. That's, how, that's how you know. You hear the pop. Oh, yeah, I think yeah. I'm done. Yeah, Dave, cut it down. One day a week, I actually think you probably will see some of I the think that'd probably be better, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Just just do that one day a week strength training and then just do jiu-jitsu three days a week. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to do anything else on your off days, you know what would really benefit you a lot is mobility. Mobility work. Okay. Mobility flow sessions, stretching. Do you have MAPS performance? That I don't have. All right, I'm going to send that to you. The mobility flow sessions in that would be amazing for you on your yeah. off days. Yeah. That would be so good for you on your off days. You'll feel so loose and- Very recuperative. Yes. All right, that sounds great. Yeah, you got it, man. We're going to send you, that over to you, Dave. Yeah. All right. Hey, uh, one more thing. Uh, Sal, I, I also train over at the UFC gym, but down here in Corona. And oh, uh, yeah. you guys are 24-hour uh, you know, former 24-hour uh, fitness folks. Uh, do you guys know Adam Sedlak? Do we know him? Yeah. Adam's yeah. been He's on the show. Adam Sedlak actually yeah. offered that club to me to grand open. So UFC, when that Corona one opened up, I had the opportunity to go be the person to grand open it. And I'd turn it down. Oh, okay. But we're still friends. Yeah, uh, Adam's a friend of mine from before they opened up the gym. But obviously, you know, he was a big 24-hour guy before he became the CEO of the UFC gym. That's yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Uh, you yep. should go back. We've uh, interviewed him on the show. He's been on the show. Oh, you have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe I just haven't hit it yet or or I'm on my way there to, to listen to it. So. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. sure, awesome. You have to say hi. We'll, we're gonna be, we're actually supposed to be meeting with him really soon again too. So uh, we just had uh, Sal's buddy who is uh, a VP oh, over there. Yeah, VP with UFC. So uh, we're definitely oh, okay. yeah deeply connected with all those yeah. guys. Are you? What's your? You want to give you your jujitsu school a shout out? 
I'm sure I'd appreciate that. That's uh, Thomas Kenny Jiu Jitsu in Corona, California. Um, and uh, he does great things out over here. It's a small gym, and uh, we, you know, we we I love training there, so it's been great. Awesome, that's awesome. Good deal, man. Right on, Dave. Yeah, let us know how it goes. All right, all right. You guys take care. Have a good one. You, you got too, it, brother. Right. He's a tough fucker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah bro. You think? You think? I, you know what? I'll tell you, dude. One <laughs> yeah. thing I did not do was not tap. I right. Away, I, I was like, I am not going to get injured. And what's the big deal? I learn. Yeah, I yeah. learn. I learn. Yeah, yeah. Because I saw a couple injuries in yeah. jiu-jitsu. I was like, whoa. There's some dudes out there, super ornery. You know. Oh, they just work. don't want to, but they're the ones they that get messed lose. up. You yeah. got to tap out, bro. That's that so shit's... funny. That's the act. That was the club that I had to. Uh, that's so wild. Yeah, yeah. That's the one. Adam Sedlick interviewed me uh, up here up north uh, and offered that that club for me to grand open that one. That was uh, that was only number. I want to say it was number two or three. Wow. It was one of the first. Yeah. UFC gyms. Yeah, and you know, people who train in jiu-jitsu or wrestling or mixed martial arts, like that takes a lot out of you. It's not just like an easy workout. Yeah. Three day for most people, okay. For most people, three days a week of jujitsu is already hitting them close yeah, to red line. That's already it. That's already whole because you're sparring and you're going full on. You're going hard with people uh for you know the last hour of class. Your whole body is, uh, you know, being expressed. I had a tough time going to sleep for the first year. My body had to acclimate. It was mm -hmm. so brutal. And so adding a bunch of strength training on top of that uh, doesn't work no, for most people. It needs to be supplemental at no. best. All right. I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out.